Nubabano? Uh, good morning, good morning, Honorable Chair. Uh, I'm Trevor Fowler, Commissioner of the uh, Commission. Uh, Dr. Mbava is, uh, had an urgent uh, engagement this morning and wasn't able to, to uh, uh, not able to come. She did intend, but something happened and uh, not able to come this morning. Thank you very much. But Thank we are, but the delegate, but the commissioners are here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for problem. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to welcome our our support staff collectively from all the, the committees, select and the standing committees. And also welcome the media, uh, everybody on the platform. You are all welcome. Uh, I just want to uh, give one house rule that is uh, common and is known to us at all times uh, as a request that please don't uh, uh, forget to open your video as and when you speak uh, so that uh, we can be able to make the work of parliament and that of the public uh, easier. But uh, I know that uh, at, at times, or most of the time, we have challenges in terms of our network stability. But if you don't have that challenge, please, uh, I request that we keep our videos on. And also, I request members to keep their mics, their mics uh, muted uh, if you are not speaking. And... Uh, we must always speak through the chairperson. Uh, you all, you are all welcomed. Can you flag the agenda? And I hope members who have all received the agenda. We have two presentations that we are going to receive today from PBO and from FFC. Um, we have, in consultation with the chairpersons and the, the support staff, consulted each other, and we found it uh, relevant that we allow the presentations to be down at, to be done at a goal. We give PBO their forty-five minutes. Is it forty-five or forty? Forty-five. Their forty minutes. No, it's 40 for PBO and FFC 40. The 45 minutes were meant for discussion. So the 90 minutes will be for members to interact with the presentations because we're dealing with a very important subject on the table. So I will therefore, without any waste of time, uh, request the secretaries to give us apologies having amended the agenda. Good morning. Thank you, Thank you Chair President. Let me go OK. Eric? Good morning, co-chairpersons, uh, and honorable members and guests. Standing Committee on Appropriations, we received one apology from Ms. Dikhale. Thank you. OK, thank you. I couldn't hear uh, Lubaba. We don't have any from. We don't committee. have. Yes, person, we don't have any apologies, Chair. And uh, earlier on during the week, we received an indication that Popo might not be present, Chair. But I, I see Honorable Siadela has joined. So I guess maybe. Um, my humble apologies. Uh, I, I forgot to acknowledge and welcome the the members who were, who were invited from the provinces, uh, chairpersons of portfolio committees. But I know at times we also are blessed by the presence of the MECs from the provinces. Thank you very much for your attendance, honorable members. Uh, can we step off this? Uh, we note the apologies and we step off from that item go to the next item, which is the presentation by PBO. Your 40, 40 minutes is the maximum. Chairperson. Thank you, honorable members. Yes, who's that? It's, 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 
Good morning, Chaplain. 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 Good morning, and we we forgot to get apologies from standing committee on finance. Alan. Okay. 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 Uh, Alan, can you do uh, that? Thanks for for that reminder. Good morning, chairman. Um, standing committee on finance. No, there's no apologies. Okay. Thank you very much. It means we have a full house. Thanks for that. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, good morning, uh, members. Good morning, colleagues in the platform. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity uh, to bring us for this morning. Um, I'm with the team. I'll just do the introduction and the reflection, and the team will take us through quickly. Uh, this is our presentation outline. Um, can I go to the next slide? Thank you so much. I think maybe we should need a PowerPoint because um, it's not clicking well. Can you make a full screen, uh, Logan? It's not showing quite fully. Um, um, I think while we uh, put a full screen there, I think, um, thank you so much. That's better. Um, the, the, our, our presentation today on our members and, and, and colleagues really focused largely on the fiscal framework. Um, you know, and provide some trend on expenditure and structure of the budget. It also highlights some of the key issues to consider in, in approving the fiscal framework. We'll look at the dollar uh, and appropriation issues later, but some of them do reflect in, in, in our presentation today. I think, according to government, the main uh, uh, objective of the budget of 2022 is to restore fiscal stability, but also support uh, households and, and recovery to the economy. There are some of the specific um, measures that were highlighted, proposed as a close one in terms of how far government intend to stabilize debt, uh, but also I like some of the pressures uh, that are, are reflected over the, the medium term. The main risks really um, to the outlook covers, looks at some of the uh, unfunded uh, spending problems that would come in at a stage, but also there are some uh, concerns around the, the slowdown of, of economic growth at time. The issue around the SOEs coming quite a lot, uh, but also the, the issue around the settlements on the wage bill. We know, noted yesterday that uh, there was a ruling by the Constitutional Court, which uh, would probably have implications in some of these conversations. We look at the policy priorities set out in the President's statement. Look at some of the reforms announced since recently, um, but also some of the structures and, 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 and issues around discussions around government revenue. Next slide, please. I think in uh, giving context into our presentation, I want to uh, raise these few points. Next slide, Um uh, Previous one. <laughs> Uh, in giving context here, I just want to uh, raise this point that the global economy, global and domestic economy outlook and the recovery has improved, as we've seen during the mid-term budget discussions. Um, this is that we've also seen additional revenue being raised by government over this time. Uh, however, it's unclear whether when you look at what's happening in global uh, uh, political issues, it isn't clear whether in the 22 budget macroeconomic and fiscal Assumption, policy assumptions really took into account the tensions that we've seen uh, that's been undeveloping between Russia and Ukraine, because this situation has deteriorated into arms conflict since the budget announcements last week, Wednesday, uh, and, and clearly uh, it could affect the, the economy, global economy outlook when you listen to the, to the discussion from other countries and are really posing uh, risks to, to the fiscal framework in this regard. But one issue that you could see is positive in a way. Um, when you look at South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia as some of the major global producers of the platinum group metals, um, any, therefore, any economic sanctions. Uh, Honorable Abraham can hear me. Can Chaperson, can you hear me, Chaperson? Honorable Abraham says, can you hear me? You, yes, Chaperson. I can hear you, Dr. Janches. 
All right, Honorable uh, uh, Darren, please help Honorable uh, uh, Abraham to can hear uh, the discussions. As I was saying, any economic sanctions on Russia, including the supply of the, the platinum group metals, may lead to increased demand for South African metals, which of course will mean the price go high as well, which in that scenario it could lead to higher than expected. We can continue. Okay, higher than expected tax revenue to equilibrate in the sector as we've seen in the time. Next slide. Um, next slide. Okay. Government estimates that current budget proposals and, and, and assumptions related to them should lead to the realization of primary balance earlier than anticipated, remember, in the midterm, in the budget last year. I think um, what I want to raise in, 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 in as a question to, 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 to South Africa or to members of parliament uh, is, is to ask what the cost has been to balance the books as, as we've been aiming, uh, given that by government's own admission, they are, they are unlikely to realize many of the targets about in the NDP. The economy has not also been adequate levels of, has not also seen adequate levels of real investment, even though uh, the government has repeatedly argued that stabilizing debt would lead to real investment in the economy. Another point, um, the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals 8 and 9, 10 compel developing countries to raise maximum revenue, including tax revenue, in order to realize those global aspirations that we signed for as, as a country. Therefore, the discussion around income tax, in particular, uh, uh, corporate taxation, cannot and should not be isolated from the broader debate about the need to reform the tax system, in particular, including ensuring that income and profits generated from the digital economy are part of the burning of the tax base. My last point, Chair and members, is that the budget uh, tax proposal around the corporate income tax assumes that the essential tax rate is a key consideration for investment, whereas there are other factors that have raised and uh, raised gain would be related to non-tax uh, uh, in, in particular. We therefore uh, um, note that as part of oversight, members of parliament may request government to provide evidence that lowering taxes will indeed lead to real investment in the economy. Uh, Chairperson, thanks so much. I'll give Dr. Orlando to take us through the rest of the presentation in the course to come. Thanks so much. Dr. Orlando. Thank you, Dr. Orlando. Um, next slide, please. Good morning, honorable members um, and guests and colleagues. I will take you through the policy and expenditure section of the presentation. Um, the 2022 budget flows from the State of the Nation address which in addition to the initiatives to grow the economy, also extends government support to poor and vulnerable South Africans. Government's fiscal policy supports allocations for the social wage. It supports youth employment. Additional allocations has been made in higher education for NESFAS. It also provides for teacher retention in basic education and health budgets has been amended for new hires and the continued response to COVID-19. The table on the next slide uh, shows the direct flow from the presidential priorities to the budget. There are, however, other pronouncements made by the president, which are not directly um, responded, and also other budget priorities that were not announced in the State of the Nation address. So the budget responses um, to SONA includes a new redesign loan guarantee scheme, and the prioritization of infrastructure projects to support economic growth and better livelihoods, especially in energy, roads, water, and water management. An additional 18.4 billion is made available for the Presidential Employment Initiative. Members, I just also want to state in terms of this, um, this is despite that no evidence has been provided for the creation of these jobs in an annual report in the annual reports of departments and the Department of Health um, actually indicated in the 2020 annual report that these funds will be surrendered. Another example um, um, is in education where a headmaster actually indicated that they didn't know what to do with these people when they arrived um, at the school. A 44 billion rand is allocated for a 12-month extension of the 350 COVID-19 social relief of distress grant, and the fight against um, 
corruption will take on new initiatives and new intensity, the strengthening of law enforcement agencies and the implementation of new anti-corruption practices in the public um, service. Next slide. Members, this diagram shows the change in the proportion spend and estimated to be spent over the medium term per budget function group. The biggest proportion of the budget is allocated towards education, which is 20.3% in 2022. Social protection receives the second biggest portion of the budget um, of 17.3% in 2022 and is estimated to decrease to 14.7% in 2022. 2024, but this is due to the COVID-19 um, social relief of distress grant that has only been expended until 2023. The third function worth mentioning is the debt service cost, which is estimated to reach 14.1% in 2022 and is estimated to increase to 16% of the consolidated budget in 2024. Um, members, what um, can also be observed from this diagram is that the change over time in the defense, public order and safety and health function groups continuously slow, um, show a decline in the pro proportion of the budget allocated towards these functions. Um, and medium term estimates are that the, the, that the proportions allocated towards economic affairs and housing and community amenities will increase. Next slide. Members, the review of the 2021 medium term expenditure framework resulted in several amendments to the 2022 medium term expenditure framework, of which the main changes were made in the 2022 financial year. The biggest increases of 36.2% and 19.1% in 2022 are the general public service and social development function groups. These amendments include the purchase of equity in ESCOM amounting to 21.9 billion and the special COVID-19 social relief of distress grant amounting to 44 billion. Almost all votes within um, the function groups received additional funding for compensation of employees and police receives an additional amount of 3.8 billion for COE in 2022 after a reduction of 15 billion during the 2021 budget process. Next slide. Um, this diagram shows the change in the proportion spent and estimated to be spent per economic classification. The two biggest categories are COE within current payments and transfers to households within transfers and subsidies. The proportion spent on COE is estimated to decrease from 35.6% in 2020 to 31% in 2024. Transfers to households amount to 18.9% in 2022 and is estimated to decrease to 16.5%, which is again due to the social relief of distress grant um, that is only um, extended until 2023. Members, one of the government's reform initiatives is to support economic growth through the infrastructure board program. With regards to this initiative, the um, portion of the consolidated budget allocated towards payments for capital assets is estimated to increase to 5.2% in 2024 25 from 4.3% in 2018. Next slide. Um, member COE is one of the key structural changes mentioned in the budget. Despite the non-completion of organizational redesigns, the review of public entities and the review of the detail underlying expenditure and compensation. So in terms of this diagram, the red line shows the increase in expenditure until 2019 and the scenario if no intervention took place. The black and gray lines show the actual and estimated expenditure from 2020 until 2024. And the green line shows the expenditure after the effect of inflation has been incorporated. Real expenditure on COE, the green line, is expected to decline to what it was in um, a decade ago. It is expected that government's review process will examine the impact on headcount, service delivery, and government's effectiveness as a result of the current estimated reductions. Next slide. Members, the initiative to support economic growth through the infrastructure build program 
will be supported by a range of other reforms, including innovative funding mechanisms supported by improved technical capabilities, such as the creation of an infrastructure technical assistance facility in the National Treasury, the development of a comprehensive focused infrastructure plan by Public Works, and unblocking, po unblocking policy and regulatory obstacles to build a pipeline of projects and the creation of a budget facility for infrastructure and the infrastructure fund. Next slide. Structural reforms um, identified by government for intervention includes um, streamlining of processes, establishing new agencies, implementing new systems and reviewing legal regimes. Most of these reforms relate to governance matters that needs to be addressed to ensure an efficient, effective and developmental orientated public service. Next slide. Members, priority one of the 2019-2024 medium-term strategic framework provides for actions that need to be taken for a developmental state that will provide conditions that grow the economy, create jobs, and improve society's quality of life. Some of these actions are informed by challenges identified by government itself, which include skills deficit, the erosion of accountability, poor organizational design, low staff morale, and that can be due to poor infrastructure and support, and the use of the the use of the tools or instruments that are available to ensure efficiency and effectiveness just needs to be strengthened. Thank you, members, and I will hand over to my colleague Siraj for the next section. Um, okay, thank you, Delia. Uh, thank you, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, greetings, and uh, all guests and colleagues. Um, I'm going to take you through the section that deals with the uh, global and, and outlook and also South Africa within the context of the 2022 budget review. Um, the global risks and uncertainty require resilience both through an inclusive recovery and a just transition. The IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations and the ILO all point to risks and uncertainty with regard to future global economic growth. Um, and and uh, as as uh, our director of the PBO mentioned the war in the Ukraine is sort of just one example of this intensifying risk. We're seeing the possibility of the current pandemic getting new variants, future pandemics and other health concerns. Um, as I said, the war is geopolitical instability and these stem from inequality, but also other tensions between and within countries. So not only wars between countries, but also war, uh, conflict within countries. Um, we've seen increasing numbers of coups around the world, particularly in Africa over the last few years. Um, environmental damage, climate change, and more incidences of severe weather, economic and financial instability, and a crisis. All these org international organizations warn about growing debt in developing countries, but it's important to note that they also caution against moving towards estimated budget surpluses too early, particularly because they may um, impact on the ability to, to provide relief and recovery um, in this period. The UN and ILO go beyond the IMF and the World Bank can, I think, correctly argue that developing countries should pursue expansionary fiscal policies that help them build resilience to future risks, not just cancer, to cyclical policies and recovery from the pandemic. So there's a need to go beyond the sort of not returning to the crisis before the crisis, and they talk about this at the global level. Um, also, um, all these organizations, but particularly the UN and ILO, talk about an, finding an international resolution to developing country uh, growing debt and, and point to international reasons for that, not only the pandemic and uh, other risks, but and the need then to find um, international solutions, not just countries cutting spending and, and affecting social expenditure. UNCTAD also cautions that three decades of structural reforms and austerity have failed. UNCTAD points to policy solutions when they say that no significant attempt has been made to support development, to reorient the global financial and payment system towards productive investment, to establish a debt workout mechanism and to make trade more conducive to sustainable de development. And so I think this is really important that we think about the role of international finance, finance within our countries and 
trade and what's happening in global value chains within the context of how we recover. In terms of redistribution, social wage and inclusive growth, the big question I think in South Africa with this 22 budget review is what does it mean when government says that it allocates 59.4% of consolidated spending over the MTF to the social wage? This formulation gives us the impression that on average the social wage is high and that it's of greater benefit to poorer households and unemployed. However, extreme unemployment and inequality, continued spatial apartheid, corruption, state caption, poor service delivery performance means that the percentage spent on the social wage is an inadequate indicator of, of uh, you know, what, what benefit they are to different parts of the population, just like the GDP is. Further, after many years of fiscal consolidation, total consolidated spending may not have increased enough. In other words, we have a pie and we're saying we're giving 60% of that pie to the social wage, um, but the pie may actually have been decreasing in size. So while rhetorically 59.4% on the social wage may sound high, it may be far from adequate. And we give some examples, particularly related to, to children in terms of um, and so we're seeing real per capita spending on almost all functions is expected to decrease, and I'll show a graph of that um, below. Um, but also in terms of the children, we're seeing the student to teacher ratio increasing. So that means that there are fewer teachers per student um, going forward and, and poorer education outcomes as a result. We're seeing um, uh, per capita uh, social protection spending going down. Um, I won't go into uh, the other points, but I think we, we presented on that before. Um, another important point to remember when we talk about the social wage is that richer households are better able to benefit from social wage spending, while spatial inequality means that they also have access to better public infrastructure and services. In other words, the portion spent on the social wage does not necessarily tell us about redistribution and building resilience in our country. A comprehensive social security system may not only improve nutrition of the poorest households, but could also improve the ability to benefit more from basic services. So we should not just be looking at what proportion we're talking about. In terms of, um, I spoke about um, showing the, the decline in real per capita expenditure. So basically we're looking at expenditure within this budget, taking into account the impact of inflation and also population growth. And you'll see that the only two areas yeah, one related to debt payments and the other one related to housing and community amenities, where over the MTF we're seeing actually real per capita growth. Um, I want to uh, continue with other points. Members can read the other two bullet points. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this, this graph, I won't go into detail, but it's just to reinforce the level of obscene inequality within South Africa. If you look at uh, the left side, it shows the percentage of the population, 1% and 9%. And if you look at the two right columns, you're basically seeing that the top 10% own more than 85% of the wealth and captured two thirds of the income. Um, below, we're seeing that inequality actually increased and increased quite significantly um, in South Africa after the elections in 1994. And this was a global phenomenon, but it means that we've been following, I think, the wrong kinds of macroeconomic policies. Next slide, please. The budget proposals exclude other reasons for low investment and unemployment. Um, the budget offers three broad measures for economic recovery and reconstruction, strengthening the fiscal position and stabilizing debt structural economic reforms, infrastructure development. And so we, we're basically saying we need to look at these and, and what, what are the real reasons for uh, unemployment and investment and, and or other additional reasons. The 22 budget review, 2022 budget review acknowledges significant risk to the fiscal outlook and continued poor levels of growth and extreme unemployment and inequality. But the budget lacks details on how government's going to build resilience to future crises. Lower deficits and debts are insufficient factors for improved macroeconomic stability. So in terms of defining what our macro stability is, we can talk about stabilizing the debt or stabilizing the deficit, but we need to look beyond that at what macro stability means. And extreme unemployment and inequality, as well as global financial volatility, are destabilizing constrained growth and detailed investment and, and will lead to a situation where we're actually not getting adequate investment and employment growth. The early evidence shows that government structural reforms are slow and inadequate to boost growth and achieve meaningful macroeconomic stability of the medium and long term. And as one of the previous slides said, UNCTAD showed that over the 
the last three decades, structural reforms have been inadequate and failed. <clears throat> so it's important to keep that in mind. The economy remains concentrated, both markets and wealth, wealthy individuals, institutional investors, such as pension funds that invest our savings and financialized non-financial corporations are not adequately allocating money towards real sector investment and job creation, but the financial activities inside and outside South Africa. So the issue of needing to save more is not enough. We need to think about what happens to the savings and where it goes. There's a risk that infrastructure is too dependent on the private sector. This is the last point on uh, the slide. And, and we're seeing that in several developed countries and, and some developing countries, uh, infrastructure investments are being done by government themselves and they're steering away from PPP for good reasons. Private sector infrastructure projects usually require government to mitigate risks and to provide all kinds of guarantees. So while in the short term, post-PPP infrastructure are not on budget and it doesn't look like uh, the budget's increasing and we can run uh, yeah, primary surpluses, the contingent liabilities relate to risk mitigation, potentially pose significant future fiscal risk that we can come and bite us in the near future. Uh, thanks, I'll pass on to my uh, colleague, Rashad Amla. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Members and Chairperson. Honourable Members, uh, the 2014-15 uh, budget and MTBPS pushed us in, shifted the public finance trajectory and fiscal policy from one of uh, expansionary fiscal policy through counter-cyclical fiscal policy towards one of fiscal consolidation, where the primary objective is to realize uh, a stabilization of debt as a share of GDP over the medium term. For this to be realized, we needed to record some primary surpluses, um, start moving towards a primary surplus, as primary surplus primarily being your total expenditure, less your non-interest expenditure needing to be above zero. Uh, and so this particular budget review, several years into the path of consolidation, continues on that trajectory. Uh, however, it's quite early relative to other budgets where we're seeing a primary surplus being projected. That's the graph in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, there are a couple of dynamics underpinning what we observe over here. First is a significantly higher than expected revenue performance in the uh, current fiscal year, and that's expected to uh, result in some stronger growth compared to what was previously expected in previous budgets in the previous MTBPS. So if you look at the graph in the top left-hand corner, that orange line and the green line at the top, that's the orange line being PBO's pre-budget estimates as well as uh, the budget review estimates for revenue. And those are quite close, uh, significantly higher than what was projected last year in the budget review and last year in the MTBPS. Now, this is important because these, uh, these graphs indicate uh, the potential for realizing a primary surplus. Uh, however, if government was to just uh, use whatever was collected over and above what was expected uh, to pay off current debt and reduce the borrowing requirement, what we would see is the potential to realize a primary surplus uh, earlier than in the second year of the MTF. And that's where the PBO uh, orange line, the bottom left-hand graph, touched uh, the zero axis. However, what was also uh, ongoing were other expenditure pressures, which resulted in government increasing the expenditure uh, projections for the MTF uh, compared to the MTPS last year and the budget review last year. So that's the graph in the top right-hand corner over here. Uh, and that results in the net effect of higher revenue and increase in expenditure, as well as a stronger outlook for growth, especially nominal growth, uh, result in the projection of a primary surplus of 3.2 billion rands in the second year of the MTF. Uh, now, this is quite important because uh, it's relatively early compared to previous estimates of a primary surplus. But what we do know is these are obviously estimates, uh, and the outcome is uh, subject to a lot of moving parts. Next slide, please. Um, as noted, uh, there was the significant improvement in the outlook compared to the budget review last year and the MTBPS last year uh, re allow for a moderation in the, the primary surplus, uh, the primary deficit, the primary balance, specifically realizing a surplus in the second year uh, and a stronger surplus in the third year of the MTF. And this allows for an easing of the debt trajectory, at least the estimated debt trajectory over the medium term. Uh, why this is quite important, if you look at the graph on the bottom of this particular slide, uh, it shows debt service costs as a share of main budget expenditure. When we as a, as a country are allocating less resources to 
um, debt service costs, we have freed up more resources to allow for other social and developmental objectives of the state. And so if this is realized, it allows for an important and, and a, a more productive allocation of uh, public resources to the budget over the medium term. Uh, again, as we've noted in the past, um, that what we see in the strong revenue performance for the current uh, financial year uh, and going forward has a, has a component of cyclicality in it, uh, arising specifically, specifically in this case from commodity prices. Uh, and it's important when we're planning going forward not to make long-term uh, expenditure commitments based on short-term uh, revenue and economic developments. Uh, and so the short of that is that there are many uh, pressures affecting uh, these, these, this particular set of outlooks for uh, public finances over the medium term. We've listed a few over there that's uh, consistent with what the government has previously listed. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if this was to be realized, and given that there is a tendency to have a bit of an upward bias in government's projections where what is actually the outcome is generally lower than what is projected uh, certainly in, in the one-year outlook, uh, that we also receive some forward guidance on what is, uh, what is meant um, as a fiscal, fiscal rule or new fiscal anchors. This is not the first time government has gestured at uh, including fiscal anchors or fiscal rule. It was previously mentioned in the MTBPS uh, in 20. 15, 16, if I recall correctly, uh, and we didn't see anything further to that. So in the interest of sustainability of public finances, as well as improving the composition, uh, it is important to, to have uh, uh, forward guidance on, on what is intended uh, and the relationship between further growth in public expenditure and the economic cycle. Um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, honorable members, guests, and colleagues. I'll be going through the changes um, in revenue. Um, so it is important to note that the objectives of the National Treasury um, changes to the tax system this year are to broaden the tax base, improve administration, and lower tax rates. Critical, we need to ask, is it possible to broaden the tax base without implementing regressive tax measures that would disproportionately impact lower income households and um, communities? So the budget 2022 proposes 5.2 billion in relief, 2.2 billion, which will be from the expansion of the employment tax incentive. I'll be coming back to this later on. Um, the 4.5% increase in personal income tax bracket will provide relief, but we note here that it disproportionately benefits upper income households. More than half of registered tax payers do not benefit, so it is critical to note that corporate income tax is de uh, decreased from 28% to 27%, and in the next slide, I'll go deeper into that. Um, and the fuel levy and road accident fund um, levy adjustments also provide significant relief, um, particularly in the context of high inflation. Next slide, please. Understanding changes to corporate income tax needs us to understand that, like many other developing countries, South Africa relies more on corporate income tax as a source of government revenue. Um, and so it is important that when we consider the change or the decrease from 28% to 27%, that we think about the long-term um, effects of changing this tax policy. What would it mean uh, for future revenue in this context? The research by the PBO has shown that you know there is no necessarily a causal relationship where if you just decrease tax, it will lead to higher investments. So it's important to think about what are actually the reasons for why business is not investing in our context. Out of 10 factors considered before investing, corporate tax was only number five. Um, and so we've shown in past research that also in South Africa, the effective tax rate, meaning what, what companies actually pay, um, is lower, significantly lower than 28%. In fact, in the mining industries, it is about 15%. So Questions need to be asked about the long-term um, effects of this decrease in tax rates, but also to think about whether it will really generate um, the investments that um, it is anticipated to um, generate. Next slide, please. The number of tax incentives that have ended um, as of yesterday, um, these include dealing with deductions in respect of rolling stock, dealing with deductions in respect of airport and port assets, um, providing for an exemption in respect of films and sales and low-cost residential units. Um, what Only one of these uh, tax incentives has been extended, which is the research and development tax, uh, which entails a deduction equal to 150% of expenditure incurred directly for 
RD. So this will be extended until 31 December 2023. Next slide. And finally, this is the last slide, but to talk about the other incentives and revenue development, what emerges from this budget is that the, there's been increases in other amounts of offshore investments that can be undertaken. One of these critical is the insurance retirement and savings funds, which has been increased. So the ability uh, for people to offshore these um, financial instruments has increased. This has significant implications for our country, given that we are trying to attract investment. Um, and this is essentially allowing for people to invest offshore at a higher rate. So we need to think about what this means for local businesses in particular in attracting funds to invest in the economy. Also, similarly, with the companies, what has um, happened is that there's been an increase in the amount that companies can process um, transfers in terms of profits and shifting between businesses. And this has tax implications because companies will now be allowed to transfer larger sums uh, between the parent company and its subsidiaries um, in our country. And then in terms of the ETI, one of the questions that has to be asked, has the ETI performed in the ways that it has been expected, and that is to ask, has it generated the jobs that wouldn't have been generated otherwise? And further research needs to be provided or evidence um, needs to be uh, provided. And so it is critical that members ask um, for this um, evidence that demonstrates that the ETI is being effective and is actually generating jobs that wouldn't have been created. And lastly, the carbon tax will be extended for three years. Um, and this means that in the long term, we might see rapid increases in um, carbon tax, um, in carbon tax, given that we've had such a slow increase in the short run. I'll pass over to Dr. Janti to take over the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Thanks so much, Chairperson. The last slide is just a uh, summary slide where we, we really recognize that the, the main objective is to stabilize uh, um, debt. But also we see in, in our analysis the visible uh, slowdowns, particularly on uh, cost of employment, um, and also the, the budget structure over the over the years shows the effect of a uh, high proportion spent uh, spend on debt um, on the functional provided by government. Analysis of the proportion of spending, so we see a lot of spending being moved towards capital expenditure. Uh, budget surplus and low debt levels, uh, as we emphasize, do not necessarily lead to macroeconomic stability, as we as, as, as emphasized in our discussion there. Uh, and also, we know that the government such reforms have not been really at the pace that was expected to realize uh, the, the intended objectives. Let's, last slide. Next slide, please. Um, we emphasize the importance of the extreme uh, that the, the unemployment inequality and the continuous battle of update corruptions um, and, and, and courses delivery really um, means that the percentage of the social wage doesn't really go with its intended tool. Uh, and, and as you see that the jail spending in some of the key areas of, of, of the development indicators uh, reduce over time, and particularly for the education, look at so many other factors that need to be taken into account to fully discuss the, 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 the issues around the social wage, economic recovery and construction have been left to be inclusive and not return us to the pre-crisis, uh, uh, crisis for crisis, a new economic growth path to build on increase in well-being and buying power of the uh, majority and the poor majority will enhance the ability of the millions of employment in South Africa to more effectively contribute to the future of the country. Thank you so much, Chair, for, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. We hope we were on time. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Team PBO. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, members? Yes, you are, Chair. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the presentation from PBO. Uh, we'll take the next uh, presentation from FFC. Over to you, maximum time. Uh, Chair, I've lost you. I'm not sure if it's only me. Please, uh, please, please continue, uh, 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 Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. 
Um, uh, we, we just first need to say that we have an apology from our chairperson, Dr. Mbaba. She apologizes for not being here today. I'm Michael Sachs, uh, I'm deputy minutes. And uh, I wanted to just invite Commissioner Trevor Fowler uh, to make some opening remarks, after which we will call on our head of research, Chen Tseng, to present the, the presentation of the FFC. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Trevor. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Sachs. Um, the presentation today will focus uh, essentially on uh, a few issues. Uh, of course, the consolidating fiscal framework, uh, noting that we're emerging uh, from the pandemic and the lockdown, and uh, the other issues that we'll be looking at are the issues relating to the financial performance of SOEs, and of course, uh, as uh, the PBO has mentioned, the, uh, the tax base, the attempt to broaden the tax base. And uh, the, the last key issue that we will be looking at is balancing social needs and uh, economic recovery. With that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, our head of research, uh, Chen Sack. Chen? Uh, thank you. Is this is yes, our first... apologies, Chair? Mr. Fowler, okay, okay, continue, please, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as this is our first engagement for the year, may I greet you uh, just with a uh, uh, compliment of the season. So following from the 2021 medium term budget policy statement and indeed the state of the nation address by the president, uh, budget 2022 is premised on uh, play, uh, balancing the priorities of placing South Africa on a path to economic and social recovery while restoring the sustainability of uh, public finances. In reading this budget uh, and the fiscal framework and all the bills uh, therein, uh, we should be mindful of the facts, uh, as our colleagues from uh, Budget Office also alluded to, of the, uh, of the external risks, a series of them, uh, to the economic outlook, and that they, those risks are elevated uh, um, by the factors. So a couple of ones, uh, but um, chief among which that, that I think uh, was uh, not mentioned, though, was that due to uh, the global supply push and demand pool inflationary pressures, that's a risk, uh, swiping from the extensive COVID interventions across the globe over the past two years, uh, resulting in faster than expected global interest rate increases uh, absorbing uh, the excess liquidities. The current conflicts with uh, sanctions. My apologies. my apologies, sir. Can you share your presentation, Ms. Green? Uh, yes, uh, Chair, let me do that. Um, there we go. Right. Apologies for that. Um, the current conflict with sanctions in the Northern Hemisphere disrupting supply channels, trade and demand uh, for raw materials, and also on the domestic front, uh, interruptions in our energy supply, labor market rigidities, uh, poor implementation, policy uncertainty, uh, corruption and escalating debt costs. Uh, with these emerging and standing uh, risks combined as a commission research in our annual submission for the Division of Revenue uh, table last year, but for this uh, Division 2022, uh, showed in terms of South Africa's growth prospects, it is improbable uh, that the economy will return to pre-pandemic pre productivity levels within this year. In fact, discounting the July unrest, our GDP is at a level last witnessed in 2017 with widening variances, um, as also the projections um, uh, from uh, all institutions, uh, uh, international and domestic, in our growth projections. Uh, therefore, the Commission advises prudence uh, with more reprioritized and targeted and investments uh, to increase efficiency and the value of spent. May I now hand over uh, to my team uh, just to take over 
uh, to take you through the Commission's submission on the fiscal framework proper with all the components that are there in uh, Sienda. Thank you. Thank you, Chen, and uh, good morning to Honorable Chair and uh, Honorable Members. Uh, I think yeah, the point uh, that the International Monetary Fund estimates that uh, global output in 2021 increased by 5.9%, uh, and this is expected to moderate in 2022 to about 4.4%. Uh, 4 and uh, the, the Ukraine and Russia con conflict, as already stated, uh, presents a, a global economic threat. Uh, that may destabilize the trajectory, the trajectory and the pattern of the recovery, and it may also destabilize general trade. And uh, this conflict also has a potential to elevate inflation globally. Next slide. So inflation is expected to continue to rise in 2022. Uh, price increases in 2022 will uh, average about 3.9%. Uh, in advanced economies and 5.9 in emerging market and developing econo economies. And what we see is that these inflationary pressures seem to be driven mainly by transitory uh, set of factors, such as pandemic-related allocation of spending from services, uh, from services to goods. And we also see that supply chain and other disruptions in productions have also contributed to this uh, inflation outlook. And we see that the, the increase in, in, in prices has implication for debt servicing costs due to, to higher global interest rates, which may come as a result of these increases. Next slide. Next. Yeah. And looking at uh, on the domestic side, uh, the economy was already starting to show signs of some recovery. Uh, as it recorded growth for four consecutive quarters before declining. Uh, by negative uh, uh, 1.5% uh, in the third quarter. And of course, as already mentioned by Chen, that the Omicron variant uh, undermined uh, economic uh, recovery progress and also the unrest in KZN and in Gauteng, they also disrupted, disrupted economic recovery. Next slide. So low levels of fixed investment in South Africa, uh, you know, uh, they, they continue to define South Africa and they've been muted for a considerable amount of time. Uh, the slow growth of fixed uh, investment raises questions uh, about the recovery's durability, if we will recover, uh, how durable will that uh, recovery and uh, it will, will it go into a, 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 a the medium and long term. So we see that uh, Total gross fixed capital formation uh, improved following a sharp decline in, in, in during the, the height of the, of the pandemic, and it was impacted by uh, COVID, of course. But we see that when you look at uh, private investment, it seems to have gone back to its uh, original trajectory. We see that uh, 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 when you look at public corporations, we see that they continue to increase even though they had uh, experienced a decline in uh, 2021 uh, quarter two. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, rising uh, unemployment uh, constrains the achievement of economic inclusion. And we see that the official unemployment uh, rate went from 34.4% in the second quarter to about 349 uh, uh, in, the, in the third quarter. And when you look at the expanded definition, that's uh, you see that right. Crisis levels, the unemployment rate increased by two percentage points to 46.6%. Uh, and uh, we see that in this budget, the government is making efforts to try and stimulate employment uh, through various interventions, such as public employment programs, the tax incentives. And we see that, for an example, in the budget, a total of 18.4 billion is allocated to support uh, youth, uh, youth employment and the creation of short-term jobs over the medium term. And we do note that these uh, jobs sometimes, these interventions sometimes show or exhibit some level of success at a, a micro level, but they've not changed the picture at a, at, a, at a macro level where they begin to dampen or decrease unemployment. So we say there is a need to, to understand why is that, that is not happening. Next slide. 
Okay. And then we looking at the consolidated at the consolidated uh, framework, we see that uh, the budget deficit uh, of six percent is six uh, percent of GDP is projected for the 2022.3 uh, uh, financial year, and this narrows to 4.2 percent of GDP around 2024-25. Uh, and we say that uh, a narrow tax base uh, and rising unemployment. Uh, put pressure uh, or there are potential threats to the reduction or narrowing of this uh, budget deficit as these will put uh, continue to put uh, pressure on public financing. We see that uh, debt servicing costs will exceed uh, three, 300 billion per year from uh, 2022 to 23, and it is becoming the fastest growing spending item. Uh, and we say the increase of, of, of uh, debt servicing costs will have a crowding out effect on uh, social spending as sometimes these uh, debt, debt uh, instruments are held by uh, people who are a bit affluent. So it seems like an increase in these debt servicing costs will favor those who are affluent. Next slide. And looking at uh, the allocations by economic classifications, what we see is that over the uh, MTF period, capital payments will increase, uh, will receive an allocation of uh, 327.7 billion, uh, which represents an average growth over the MTF of 12.2%. And we see that also capital transfer will uh, increase uh, by an average growth of 7.9%. And we also see that uh, when we look at uh, uh, compensation of employees, we see an average growth of 1.8% of, uh, over the, the, the MTF period. Uh, we also see a similar growth uh, uh, when it comes to goods and services. And we, these, these increases uh, uh, may, may not uh, represent uh, the, the, the priority of trying to, to stabilize or to try and, and do some fiscal consolidation at, at, at a face value, but more drilling into them uh, is, is required. Next slide. And then we see with the allocation by functional classification, we see that over the MTF period, uh, the learning and culture decreases by 1.1%. And you also see that the social uh, development decreases by 2.5%. And we say uh, this, this, in fact, when you look, the only, uh, the only function that increases is, is the community development and the economic development increase. They are the only ones that increase over the MTF. And we say uh, with these budget cuts that are projected into the MTF, there must uh, be consideration of the effect of these cuts on employment, so a balance between budget cuts and employment preservations must be attained uh, to ensure that people are not, are not disadvantaged. And next slide. And in terms of this, I think we, we must uh, mention that the commission notes that uh, corporate income tax rate has been reduced by one percentage point to 27%. And uh, we do uh, echo, echo what has been said that there's a need to further understand that investor behavior, especially if the cards are motivated by, uh, a, 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 by, by trying to improve investment, what other factors try, will drive investment uh, so that we don't see these cards and then uh, there's no, no uh, improvement in investment as shown in the previous slides that, that, that uh, I've, I've were displayed. Okay, but cross text, okay, next slide, I'll hand over to, to uh, Sasha, to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Siander, and good morning, Chair, members of the committee and colleagues. Um, this section emphasizes some highlights from the 2022 appropriation bill, so looking more at the national departments. Um, and when we look at the bill in its totality, it will allocate just over a trillion rand across the various votes for the 2022-23 financial year. Um, when we compare that allocation to the revised estimates for 2021-22, this represents uh, a nominal increase of 3%. 
Um, and when we look further across the years of the medium term expenditure framework, we see that that positive growth that is being projected for this new financial year will not be maintained the year thereafter. So in 2023-24. Um, so definitely the revenue info allows um, has allowed for some increases um, for 2022-23, um, but departments are set to feel uh, the pinch in the second year of the, the MTF period. Um, and the next two slides just highlight some issues that the Commission would like to emphasize um, for the committees regarding the, the votes. Uh, can we stay on the previous one, please? Um, uh, previous one. Um, so the largest uh, allocation across the national votes is the social development vote, and there are three key developments um, that will occur there. Uh, the first is the extension of the social relief of distress grant for another 12 months. Um, we know that this comes at a cost of 44 billion and has been enabled by the revenue windfall. The second development is the adjustment to the child support grant, um, which is will now be expanded to include double orphans. And then the third development um, is the link of the social security uh, grants to inflation. Um, so overall, the commission supports these interventions, which we think will bring uh, uh, relief to poor and vulnerable households who rely on these grants, um, especially given the detrimental effects of the past uh, two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in terms of the timing of these developments, the social relief of distress grant is set to stop in March 2023. Um, while the last two developments of linking to inflation and extending the child support grant will be implemented um, or we set to commence in, in 2023 as well. Um, regarding the permanent replacement um, for the social relief of distress grant, the Commission notes the process is underway to identify a sound alternative. Um, and for the Commission, one of the central um, considerations that uh, you know, should be kept front and center when evaluating the viability of any replacement is the long run effect um, that such a replacement would have on the sustainability um, of the fiscus. Um, can we move to the next? Uh, thank you. Uh, the other area of funding that has benefited from the revenue windfall is higher education, where an additional uh, 32.6 billion will be transferred through this vote to the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Um, and the funding will be used to continue funding for existing bursary holders and to provide funding for new entrants into the system. Um, and here the Commission would like to highlight the fact that uh, providing bursaries to existing and new students is not a, a temporary or once-off type of support. Um, what it does is uh, it creates future, a future funding obligation at the very, for the very least over the short to medium term. Um, thus, due consideration must be given to govern government's ability to sustain this level of funding, funding over the medium term. Um, because if this is not being done, the, the higher education and training vote will come under severe pressure um, in the second year of the MTF, which is 2023, um, especially if revenue recovery does not um, happen. Um, we do, however, note that according to the budget review, a new higher education funding model will be introduced in 2023. Um, so, with us, uh, we await the contents of, of the new that new funding model. Um, then, with respect to basic education, it's another key vote. Um, we note nominal increases over the next three years, um, but of course, what is uh, more important is what happens at the provincial education level because that is where delivery of basic education is located. Um, and uh, within the sector, and my colleague will touch more, my colleague Eddie will touch more on this, but there is additional funding aimed at assisting provinces with addressing the shortage of teachers. But again, as with the point made with the higher education vote, um, once you employ more teachers, you create a future expenditure obligation. So should there be slower growth or reductions, then this uh, basic education sector will be, again, be under pressure. Um, if, can we move to the next slide, please, Chair? Um, so alongside the increased funding for social protection programs, government has also utilized the additional revenue to improve funding to uh, certain economic development departments, um, and this funding is largely in respect of infrastructure investment. Um, the notable allocations in this regard include an additional 5.3 billion uh, in respect of water and, and sanitation, 
um, and it's largely to fund um, regional bulk infrastructure. And then also um, an additional 45.3 billion um, is allocated to the transport vote and will be used to address the backlog uh, in upgrading and refurbishing the national uh, non-toll road network. So in these two aspects, um, water is criti critical for health and economic uh, development reasons. Um, likewise, with transport, a good road infrastructure uh, facilitates trade of goods and services. It's also critical for economic growth and development. So in both aspects, the Commission supports the targeting of funding towards these two uh, votes. The key, however, uh, will be in the rollout of these infrastructure projects. Um, as members um, are all too aware, infrastructure management is, um, is, has been a challenge um, which can uh, serve to inhibit the possible gains that, that we can derive from, from this type of spending. Um, moving to the next slide. Um, so in terms of the recommendations for this section, um, overall, the Commission supports government's decision to prioritize funding for social protection and economic development. Um, but we need to keep in mind the temporary nature of the increased funding and be aware that in some instances, that additional funding for 2022 will create uh, future expenditure obligations across certain sectors. Um, and uh, should revenue not recover, these sectors will come under significant um, pressure. So we uh, would advise departments to be aware of this potential threat and to be proactive in devising uh, contingency plans to fund commitments um, should the need arise. Um, we'd also like to emphasize the need for finalizing the new higher education funding model uh, with haste. Um, thank you, I'll hand over to Eddie. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Honorable Members. I'll take you through quickly to the provincial overview of the provincial government allocation. So what we see now is that the 2022 budget proposed a total allocation of 682 billion, or which or two, two trillion rand over the MTF uh, allocate by the period to the provincial fiscal framework, which is by no means a small allocation. But when you look at where that money goes, uh, provinces mostly are labor intensive. So a big chunk of that money, 70 to upwards of 70 to 80% goes to um, uh, compensation of employees. When you compare that with what uh, the 2021 MTPBS was proposing, it's actually much higher. It's actually a, a much better improvement from what the 2021 um, uh, MTPBS was promising. And uh, it is a result of the adjustment mainly uh, over the MTF, mainly to deal, deal with the, the shortage of teachers and LTSM so shortage. So because of the consolidation that was uh, mostly uh, burdened on the provincials, so as a result, we've had a uh, teacher shortages and uh, LTSM shortages. So we've had to bring uh, to have some additional allocation to plug the, those those can. And well, for some time, the commission has been mentioning the, the needs to really monitor the implication of this um, con uh, budget consolidation on provincial de delivery outcomes or delivery delivery targets so that you don't deal with them in this kind of haphazard manner. You, you plan for them over a period of time. And uh, the, the risk, that which my colleague Sasha has already mentioned is that should the revenue not uh, should the revenue collection projections not realize in the way that have been projected, uh, the spending the obligation which are associated with this uh, particular uh, uh, interventions to address teacher shortages is going to create budget pressures in the province uh, in the in the provinces going going forward. But what you also notice is that notwithstanding this upward adjustment, you, you still find that the, the 2022 MTF allocations are still below the projection which were made in 2019. This just really speaks of the stagnation that you are seeing in the allocation uh, to provinces. So, so the continual current allocations are slightly are beginning to catch up to the pre-COVID-19 levels, uh, albeit at a very slow, great, great, uh, slow growth rate. And the average growth uh, of, of total conditional grants over the MTF allocation amounts to 6% in, in nominal terms. So there is a little bit of recovery, but it's still very small. Uh, next slide, please. The, 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 the next slide generally just shows you the, 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 the dire situation of stagnant provincial allocation. If you, if you take 2019, just before the COVID as a baseline, as a baseline or a benchmark. So you can actually see that we, they, there is no growth at all. And this is not really peculiar to provinces, but the, the issue we really like to emphasize is that 
this has got implication for provincial budgets because adjustment has to be made on not only on the budgets but on the delivery outcomes and the delivery targets and that's why the focus of the provinces uh, as they prepare their budget should be to make sure that uh, uh, the adjustment do necessarily uh, uh, disadvantage the delivery outcomes next slide so the, the next set of slide it just shows you the kind of impact we see in the, on the provincial conditional grants in the main we'd like to pinpoint the Human settlement developing grant. This grant has really uh, the, 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 the harshest burden of the of fiscal consolidation. And again, the, the, the implication for that is that people who are on the waiting list for the deliver house uh, passes uh, are going to be uh, even delayed much further. So people who are supposed to be receiving houses would then have to wait a little bit more longer because of this uh, uh, of the of the cuts which have happened to to the house to the housing to the human settlement development grant and the main issue again we'd like to highlight here is that in the absence of a of a, of a, of a, of a much much more bigger focus on the provincial uh, conditional grants we're going to have this uh, we we seen this uh, almost inconsistent cuts in the in the in the in the allocation to infrastructure grants not linked to to the long term uh, delivery objectives especially even also the development uh, uh, objectives of the county in relation to the, the national development. So if you don't have that long-term uh, uh, plan linked to, to your cuts, you're likely going to see this inconsistent allocate, allocation. So again, with the emphasis we'd like to make is that these cuts have got to, there's got to be some framework which informs this cutting so that you, you focus on, uh, 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 you fo your cuts focus on infrastructure grants which do not necessarily impair your long-term development objectives. Uh, the other issue is the, is the we also see that the HIV malaria community outreach program. Uh, there, there's a point we've made last uh, uh, recently about the number of subcomponents within that grant. So we see a bit of consolidation in that grant, but also we see a, a slight a slight increase in the grant. So as much as this is very welcome from the commission's perspective, uh, we also note that the, the prioritization on this particular grant should be on preventative measures rather than curative, curative measures, as you increasingly see that the more funding is being allocated towards preventative measures. So uh, next slide. The last slide really is just a recommendation from this uh, particular section, which really implores government to identify selected delivery indicators and provide assessment of those of, of service delivery levels uh, between uh, from 2020 to the current budget so that we can see what exactly has been the impact on those delivery targets so that in the next round of the budget uh, there, there will be much better prioritization as to where the additional allocation will be targeted at. The, also the commission also knows that despite the 246 billion uh, which is added to, to the provincial equitable share uh, 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 to deal with provincial uh, shortage of, um, of educators and LTSM, the commission recommends that there the, the should be there's a need to consider the carry through cost of these uh, funding obligations going forward. Because if you don't provide for that again, that will be a significant uh, uh, a negative impact on provincial budget. Uh, next, uh, I think I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Nomonde just to continue the local government part. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, morning, honourable members and colleagues, I will take you through to the local government. Uh, local government, we know that it has been a, it's going to be a challenging year for the municipalities, given the political landscape that have changed uh, drastically uh, in terms of the coalitions uh, that have been formed. We know that uh, if there are no check and balances in place, it can, it can impact on the service delivery. Also, while these, changing, while these changes are taking place, uh, they are happening against the backdrop of COVID-19, which has amplified uh, challenges related to access to basic services, as well as uh, municipalities under f uh, financial distress. We know that about over 68% of municipalities are, are in financial distress. In addressing some of these challenges, the Commission notes and welcomes the review of the local government capacity building system, which started in, in 2021 with its implementation and the search for 2023. The commission is of the view that such initi initiatives will enhance municipal performance and move the local government sector forward and quicken the recovery process. Another welcomed um, development in the local government sphere is the strengthening of home uh, municipal revenue through development charges, 
which plays a critical role in financing infrastructure uh, related projects as well as uh, boosting economy. More so, uh, FFC welcomes this approach as it is in line with its submission in the 2020-21 uh, Division of Revenue for supplementary revenue sources of municipalities to supplement their own revenue. While these changes are, are happening, the Commission further stresses that the reviews currently taking place in local government should be synchronized with the district development model, which seeks to address uh, some of the delivery failures at the local level. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, really shows uh, the local, equipment, uh, local equitable share in terms of the allocation as well as the real growth uh, over the years. Uh, currently, the share of local government allocation uh, is expected to increase over the medium term uh, from 9% in 2022 23 to double digit, which is something uh, that was not happening previously in the last two years uh, related to, to COVID, as well as fiscal consultation that has happened in the past. The Commission is of the view that uh, for municipalities to fulfill their constitutional mandate of providing these basic services, they will need to improve on efficiency spending. Uh, while this is happening, cooperation governments from national and provincial governments should be at the core. Uh, next slide. Here, this slide shows actually the, the average uh, growth uh, rate transfers of the local government, the equitable share and the conditional grants. Uh, total local transfers will increase over the MTF by 4%. The increase in local equitable share allocation, uh, we know that it has resulted in a positive uh, uh, growth rate uh, in terms of average real growth rate by 6%. The Commission welcomes the government efforts to keep the LES growth rate above inflation through the increased allocation that have taken place in the local government. The FFC is of the view that the positive real growth rate of the LES will go a long way in, office, in offsetting the ever-increasing cost of basic services in the sector, thereby enabling the sector to provide basic services to the needy. Likewise, we see um, in the graph the, the steady positive real growth rate on conditional grants over the 2022 MTF, which uh, is in line with uh, government's uh, infrastructure-driven uh, economic recovery plan. However, in the la last outer year of uh, the MTF, we see some negative uh, growth rate, which uh, FFC notes with concern because it will actually defeat the purpose of the, the economic recovery plan. Also, in terms of conditional grants, this graph shows uh, the transfer window of the local government, which is the infrastructure, the capacity grants, and the equitable formula. Equitable formula. The figure shows uh, indeed a steady decline in real growth rates on infrastructure of the, over the MTF, while the capacity grants uh, record stem still and even uh, recording negative growth rates in the years. The Commission also notes the long overdue reviews of the capacity building system and infrastructure grants taken by uh, government. Previously, the Commission has recommended for conditional grants with similar purpose to be consolidated so as to maximize efficiency. We are of the view that while these reviews are taking place, this uh, will be noted. Also, in terms of conditional grants, uh, FFC note the addition to the baseline on direct conditional grants over the 2022 uh, MTF of 3.6 3.6 billion. Uh, these are made up of the neighborhood development grant, the public transport uh, network grants. The Commission welcomed the addition to these infrastructure related grants as they are in line with the economic recovery plan, which is set through the infrastructure uh, uh, led projects, which uh, in the main uh, are of the view to boost economic growth and employment. However, during the 2022 MTF, municipal conditional grants based lands are expected to be reduced by over a billion, which uh, consists of uh, from the direct from the direct co uh, conditional grant of eight seventy five million and one forty five million from the indirect uh, conditional grants. Uh, these reductions to the baseline are mainly due to understanding and uh, FFC notes this with concern. The, F, the Commission is often view that these reductions send a negative signal to what the government is trying to accomplish by investing in infrastructure uh, catalytic projects. 
In terms of the recommendation, the Commission welcomes uh, government efforts to keep LES growth above inflation, as it will indeed uh, go a long way in offsetting the increases in the basic services. Uh, uh, services. The Commission also notes and welcomes the review of capacity building system and infrastructure grant, as it is of the view that it will enhance municipal performance and move the local government sector, as well as quicken recovery process. The Commission further stresses that this review initiative should be synchronized with the DDM, which seeks to address uh, critical uh, issues of municipal finance delivery failures at the local government. Lastly, the Commission also stresses that municipalities must improve the efficiency spending with cooperative support from the other two spheres of government through the monitoring, reporting, and evaluation so that the municipalities can be able to fulfill their constitutional mandates. I'll pass over to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Monde. Good morning, uh, Chairperson, honorable members, and all colleagues that are present on the on the platform. Uh, I will quickly, I'll quickly take you through um, the contingency liabilities, uh, uh, government guarantees, as well as the financial uh, performance of uh, some of the SOEs. So, with regards to guarantees to state owned companies. What we know from budget 2022 is that uh, contingency liabilities are increasing, primarily driven by uh, government guarantees to SOEs. Uh, the table on this slide shows uh, that government guarantees to ESCOM, for instance, uh, are averaging more than 5% of GDP between 2017-18 uh, and 2021-22. Uh, and uh, this we, we're saying it's, it's a very high level of government guarantees that are going to SOEs and they are constituting a fiscal risk uh, in relation to debt uh, sustainability. So our ana analysis show, shows that um, if all government guarantees were to materialize, government debt will increase to more than 100% of GDP, GDP by 2026. Uh, next slide. So this slide uh, shows the financial uh, performance of, of ESCOM. What, what, what is apparent from, from this slide is that uh, uh, ESCOM's liabilities have increased uh, uh, substantially between 2017 uh, and 2020. Uh, but most importantly, what, what, what we see is that it net, its net loss has increased from 2.3 billion uh, in, in 2018 to 18.9 billion. Uh, in, in 2021, showing <clears throat> really that the, the, the institution is not uh, in a very good fun, uh, financial health. Next slide. So this slide shows the financial performance of SABC and, and Transnet. So what is uh, what, what we see from, from Transnet, <laughs> what we see from Transnet uh, is that uh, the net value of uh, 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 Trust that has decreased from 143 million to 129 million in, 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 in 2021. And uh, most, impo uh, most importantly, uh, Trustnet has posted a net loss uh, of 8.4 billion in 2021 uh, 22 after having, after having posted um, uh, successfully so. Or, over a long period of time, a uh, positive uh, profit uh, margin, but uh, this has changed in, 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 20, in 2021 because it has ex experienced a loss. Uh, <clears throat> from okay. from SABC. Hello, sorry, sorry, presenter. Just, just, just re uh, 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 repeat uh, the net asset value, you said it in, in millions. I want, think you wanted to say it in billions. Oh yes, <clears throat> my apologies for that. It increased from 143 billion to 129 billion, 143 billion in 2017 to 129 billion in 2021. And uh, with regards to SABC, what we see is that uh, SABC liabilities have been also increased uh, between 2017 and, and 2020. And uh, SABC has constantly uh, posted a net loss for the for 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 the post. Post, past five years, uh, it, it, its net loss to reached uh, 1.3 1, 1. Uh, billion in 2017 before declining to 524 million in 2021, uh, after it, it had already registered a, a, a net loss of uh, five, 511 million in, in 2020. Next slide. 
so what, what what we want to emphasize as the commission is that the uh, the SOEs are critical for economic development, but they are worsening operational and financial performance are placing a, a very heavy burden on, on the fiscals. Uh, the financial health of uh, SOEs is measured, is measured by, by key financial ratios, uh, by net asset values, as we've seen, and, and the profit margin reflects a very weak um, uh, financial uh, performance for, for this institution. Uh, but the, the commission notes uh, and supports the proposal for a centralized shareholder model for commercial SOEs as proposed uh, by the 2012 presidential uh, committee report on state-owned entities and the government uh, initiative uh, to publish a framework outlining the criteria for funding uh, uh, for the funding of uh, SOEs. The commission believes that these in initiatives will assist uh, in the reforms that are necessary. For SOEs, I will head over to my colleague uh, Sabela to to carry on with the public infrastructure investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ando, and good morning to honourable members, to the chairperson, and everyone present in the platform. Yes, I am going to take you through the public infrastructure investment. What what has happened here? We know that uh, the Sorry, yes. Sabelo. Sabelo, sorry. Can you open your video if you can, please? If possible, please. Okay. I hope it's coming. I still can't see you, but uh, keep trying and continue with your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay, as I was saying, continue. I, don't know what, I see. All right. Okay, as I was saying, that the the one of the key important thing uh, probably to to revive the economic growth is investment in infrastructure. Then the, the plan for economic recovery includes investment in infrastructure, which is undertaken by either by national provinces or, or municipalities or local government, as well as public entities and, and state-owned companies. And this presentation that I'm, I'm, I'm presenting here I'm doing it in relationship with what the Tando has just presented on the performance of the state-owned entities. And then here, what we see here is that the total uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure investment has, has been increasing, even if you look at 2018-19, uh, and then it decreased uh, the following two years, and then now, but it's starting to, it started to pick up in 2020-2021. And uh, no, I'm still on that slide, sorry, Chan. And, and then now, what, what you see, even in the outer years, is, is it, will, it will just continue to pick up. But now, the, the key thing, you can go to the next slide, Chan. The key thing now is, is who, who does most of public uh, infrastructure investment or infrastructure. Then this, this slide here shows that the state-owned companies which has been presented by, by Tando as not performing very good, uh, are dominating with respect to public infrastructure investment. As, as you can see, even on 2021, uh, they, they are starting to pick up and then going forward, even to in, in outer years, the, the shares are, are very high. So now what does this tell us is that these are, are, are the drivers of our public infrastructure investment, the state-owned owned companies. But now, given the performance of, of these SOEs as presented by Tando, are we confident that we'll get uh, returns on our investment that we're expecting to? And then if, if not, then, then we we'll must be careful because such investment will be lost, won't see any returns. And then following up again, what, what we are noting here is that if, if you look at the, the public, public entities, they, they are... The, the other ones that are picking up, up even in the outer years. You can see from 2020, 2021, 
then the 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 graph is, is going up. So meaning which both the public public entities and state-owned companies are, are being used by the government as key with respect to public infrastructure investment. But again, if we think about the kind of infrastructure or, or the role of these different uh, spheres of government, like national provinces and local government, we, we know that national is more involved in administration and the provinces are mostly on uh, schools, uh, health and education, like schools, clinics, uh, hospitals, etc. What we are noting here is that the investment by, by provinces is on the decline, as you can see from 20, 2019, 2020, even in the outer years, it is on the decline. But now, again, what is most concerning is that we know that the role played by the local government or municipalities with respect to the provision of the basic infrastructure as it relates to as it leads to the provision of basic uh, services. But what, what we see here, local government is one of those fears that are, are not investing much, are not given much public structure investment role by the government because you, you see local government here from 2020, 2021, and then you see from there the graph shows a negative that the shares of, of this fear with respect to investment is going down. And then you, you ask yourselves, because we, we have such huge backlogs and municipalities are, are struggling on maintaining and, and providing infrastructure for, to provide basic services, then this picture, will it take us where we want to go? Okay, the next slide. Okay, on, on, on this, in this section, we're highlighting three key recommendations given what you presented, myself and Tando, that the government should assess the SOEs in order to appraise their profitable feasibility, operational efficiency, their track records in resolving market failures and attaining developmental goals. And secondly, that government should harmonize legislative framework for, for these SOEs in order to, to remove legal ambiguities, reinforcing implementation and improving improved disclosure and reporting requirements. And last, you are calling upon government to implement necessary operational governance and financial reforms that would enable SOE, SOEs to effectively and efficiently drive infrastructure in order to realize returns to investment, as we've seen that they are the ones that have a bigger role to play in the provision of infrastructure. I think I'll hand over to it. I, I think it's going to close and summarize. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, this is my, the last section. I'll try to be brief in consideration of time constraints. So the last section, really, we're trying to look at uh, how do we achieve the balance between economic, social recovery, and also fiscal sustainability. There's always debate in academia and also policy circles as to what should be your overall fiscal stance to, to inform your long-term macroeconomic goals. As, uh, and, and sometimes these policy goals are sometimes seen as counterbalancing each other. Whether you, so in other words, how can you achieve economic recovery and, and social <coughs> and social recovery at the same time while you also maintain fiscal stability because you, you need resources to finance your, your, your recovery. So our starting point is that the, the South Africa's initial response to the economy to the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic really hold lesson for a more balanced and synchronized, synchronized approach to, to recovery while it also while also stable, while it also maintaining stable public finances. So I've seen we've had a three-pronged approach to returning to, to, to normality, which entailed overcoming the health crisis through social distance requirements and election measures. We've also seen quite a number of measures which we introduced to protect livelihoods in the face of um, devastating income losses. Uh, so there's a number of relief measures that were introduced by the president to support the, the people's livelihoods. And we also have seen quite a number of measures which were uh, intended to support small businesses, such as your 
income tax deferrals, your the, the operational loans, and, and, and some payment holidays on, on insurances. The extent to which how effective those has been, we will see still something that is really out, uh, out in the open. But going forward into the 20, 20, uh, 2022 budget, what we see is that we they, they still, we continue to see that trajectory or that kind of a, of a thematic focus where there's a strong emphasis on people-centered and social recovery with an allocation of about uh, 1.1 trillion. Um, there's also some provision for consumption and investment, which my, my colleagues have spoken about, uh, the, 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 the suspension of the increase on RAF and um, on, on RAF, uh, on RAF, on the full levy and RAF and, and full levy. The, the tax cut, this uh, corporate income tax cut, uh, which is supposed to, to boost investment in the, in, the, in the long term. But we also see some kind of a um, uh, retention or retaining the economic function expenditure in in the budget, but what our overall what we say is because the there is also always argument about as to whether which particular uh, intervention should you prioritize in terms of your of your budgeting interventions, and the, the given the bi bi directional relationship between these two potentially contra contradictory or counterbalancing objectives, uh, there is a need to 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 really understand. Uh, this uh, the impact of these interventions on the economy itself and the, and the budget, so that you can inform your 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 your, your overall national fiscal framework going forward. And what in one of the things that we mentioned in the document, in the overall document, is that the the policy papers which are underpinning some of the decision to cut the taxes must be must also be published as part of the budget review, so that they can be subjected to to scrutiny, especially the assumptions which are being made in in those papers. Uh, next slide. So when you look at the some of the economic uh, uh, expenditure interventions which are made uh, as part of the economic uh, reconstruction and recovery plan, what we note there is that despite the fact that the, the economic recovery plan identifies infrastructure rollout, the localization and industrialization, as, as well as, as uh, food security, among other things, as, as crucial interventions for, for, for job creation, what we see in, in the allocation is actually contrary to, to the overall uh, goals of the infrastructure uh, recovery and uh, reconstruction plan. In the main, what we note is that the, the infrastructure spend is marked by delivery and management deficiencies. That is the point that the commission has made over a long period of time. And that's put a drag on the economy, on, on economic growth because projects are not being completed on time. If they are completed, they are sometimes uh, 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 up, uh, accompanied by poor workmanship. Uh, and of course, that it won't be, they won't affect, they won't uh, uh, bring the growth that we anticipate because of, of those delays, because we must spend a lot more money for ratification to to, to deal with the poor workmanship. So that really uh, takes us back. Now, when we also look at the manufacturing incentives um, and the product system development allocation programs within the, the DTI board, uh, you act we actually note that there's a decrease of 9% and 60%, 6.3% over the MTEP. Again, this goes against the, 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 the goals of the, of the economic construction and recovery plan, which have now uh, identify localization, industrialization is a key priority or, or key lever to, to assist in the recovery process. Again, also when you look at the allocation for food security, we also see the same kind of reductions uh, to, uh, to, the, to the program. Again, going against the, which then ask the question, what, how do we identify whether a program is a priority if the funding associated with that program is now, is now being cut? Of course, this is part of the overall, uh, overall, uh, Consolidation process, but the consolidation process must also be linked to the to the to, the, to your overarching economic uh, economic recovery objectives over the long run. One of the other things we noticed that the, the infrastructure front is, is one of the it has been identified as one of the key instruments to crowd in, crowd in private investment and to fast track approval uh, process, uh, 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 approval processes for large infrastructure projects. But the, really, the the caution we'd like to make with the, with particular with this kind of, of uh, intervention is that if they are not sit, if they are not sitting within they, they should operate within the confines of the IGR principle but especially in respect of equitable distribution of projects and being uh, assigned to a board so you want to see projects which are funded through this particular uh, fund also being uh, being, being found in provinces like in your rural provinces like your eastern cape and northern cape so that 
it's not only the private sector which is funding this, uh, the, uh, which is funding, which is di which is the, uh, directing the, 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 the where the plot projects are located, which are mainly support, which are more, most likely to be in the urban areas. So there is a need to also focus on the rural areas as part of the next slide. Yeah, the next slide really just shows to the, the, the share of the economic uh, uh, economic expenditure interventions. Uh, and as you can see, the, the, the largest share goes to economic regulation and infrastructure, uh, followed by, uh, by the industrialization exp exports. But as I said, there is a, we're noticing a, de a declining trend over, over, over the, ne the, the next years. So in light of this, we, the commission recommends that the budget process for the following year must focus on realigning the 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 the, the budget the budget the, the the allocations to the economic reconstruction recovery plan. Uh, just in completion, chairperson, this would be the, our last slide. Uh, so the, the, the overall, the, the the commission support the budget, the 2022 budget, and continued commitment to co of consolidating public finance, while also supporting the pandemic uh, responses, job creation, social protection. So, uh, so the commission would like to follow uh, emphasize the following points. Mainly, it's obvious is, is the fact that given the the, the 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 projection for economic growth, which may not likely to 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 us to, <coughs> to to be realized. Uh, there's a need to be they need to be careful going forward as to how we uh, reallocate your, your resource the, the resources uh, the second point is that the regarding the revenue and tax policies sorry uh, commission support government approach focusing on the tax base and last and, and the other point is that uh, given the windfall that we have seen in the collection of revenue in the in this particular year we should be careful of the long-term uh, expenditure obligations that we're making by making allocations to programs to do to the expenditure plan items such as your, uh, your compensation of employees, as we've mentioned, with the shortage of teachers. So that, as well as the NSPAS, NSPAS funding uh, to low income uh, NS. We, in the case, in case uh, the revenue that we, we're hoping that we're going to collect in the next year, if, if it does not recover, again, we should be mindful of that. The commission also applauds the efforts and outcomes associated with the, sorry, next slide. Uh, associated with government attempts to stimulate employment through the numerous inter in the interventions, but we, however, this has not changed uh, the macro level picture of, of unemployment. So in this regard, more significant structural uh, reform uh, on art, art, art designer skills are required to address unemployment in the long run. Next slide. And lastly, is that given the, the, the role that municipalities play in directing free basic services to indigent households, the commission supports the growth in the allocation to, to this year. Last, the, last, the last point we really like to make in this, this, with this regard to this particular project is that uh, uh, notwithstanding the progress and which the progress which is being made with the economic recovery and social recovery alongside social, uh, social stability, the commission is of, is of the view that the budget has placed a, a stronger emphasis on people-centered and social recovery by allocating 1.1 uh, trillion to total budget to, of, uh, to social wage program. But uh, the budget further provides for expenditure side economic recovery levels through the economic functions, which is said to receive uh, 277 billion. So the main issue here is just to emphasize this alignment of the of the expenditure objectives of this economy of of, of the expenditure side of the economic recovery with the allocations uh, going forward. Uh, that would be the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Eddie. And uh, just, Chair, before handing back to you to say that we also have uh, Commissioner Lawrence Erasmus and Commissioner Elsa B. Rockman, and uh, as you saw, uh, Commissioner Trevor Fowler on the call, and we're, we're happy to answer questions of the committee. Thank you very much from us. Uh, are you there? Miss, I'm here. Am I audible, Chair? Yes, you are. Am I audible? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation from both the PBO and the FFC. Uh, um, I will help, help me with the identification of the members who have raised their hand who wants to speak. 
And after uh, recognizing them, uh, some might uh, be experience some might experience technic technical glitches. So if you do uh, experience technical glitches, please uh, call for our attention. We will recognize you. I see Ahmed. Yeah, shaky mom. Thank you, Chairperson. Just hold on, please. I'm just recognizing others. Honorable Dion, Josh. Honorable Entertain uh, Letani. Honorable Entertain uh, Tennis Ryder. Uh, Honorable uh, Sheikh. Honorable Vessel. Honorable Ockham, Pilot. Who else? I might be not seeing others. Matafa Chair. Oh. Honorable who? Matafa. Matafa. Thank you, Honorable Matafa. I see Bandile Masu, Dr. Bandile Masu. Okay, Honorable Kaiso. Who else? You can call for my attention. Whoever is not uh, able to raise their hand except the chairperson. Chairperson Maso, okay. we are fine. Thank you. I will come to the chairpersons after oh, okay. the members. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I want to give the members first. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Can I allow Honorable, I mean, uh, Honorable Munzo to start? Thank you. Thank you very honorable much, Chairperson. Munzo. Thank you, Chairperson. It's Sheikh Imam, Ahmed Manzoor, Sheikh Imam. Thank you very much. Uh, my first question is to both the PBO oh. and the FFC. <laughs> okay. Uh, both of them, tell me what role do you play? And what levels of engagement exist between your structures and government as uh, 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 currently, particularly the cabinet, in terms of the decisions they're taking and the role that you play in giving guidance or advice to the Minister of Finance? That's the first question. The second one is the issue on corporate tax. Do you think it was necessary? Because I don't know of businesses that have been looking for a 1% uh, tax reduction, particularly, I'm not sure and I'm not certain, like I think you've also alluded that it's going to entice or encourage them uh, to invest in the country. But would you agree if I say that what they would be more interested is uh, political stability in the country, a mess, more secure country, uh, dealing with the issues of crime that might convince them that indeed South Africa is a good prospect for investment. Now, on the issue of Nesbus, I see you welcome this, which I also welcome. However, what is your feeling about the fact that... Honorable Chair. Six... Yes, yes, I'm with you. My apologies. Uh, can you uh, please uh, open your video? As you My video is open. possible, please. My video is open, Chairperson. You... Can you not see me? It's and I'm looking. Oh, I can't see you. Okay. I'm looking. Okay. <laughs> okay. I can. I can see you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. On the issue. Of okay. Nesfus, I can see. You. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. On the issue of Nesfus, whilst you welcome it, and we all do, the question is that you have a sixty percent drop out in the first year. Does not that not tell you that we need to address the quality of education rather than just rolling out funding 
which a great percentage of gets wasted because of the high uh, dropout in the first year. Now, this, the next thing is on the issue of policing, which is 12,000 new recruits we are going to get. What is the impact on this? A positive impact, given the fact that these are going to be new recruits who still have to be trained. They're coming in as, will be then become constables. On the other hand, many of them are leaving the police force because we've reduced the retirement age to 55, which means we are losing a lot of skills over and above the fact that many of them are unhappy about the promotion system and things in the country. Now, you know, do you see any positive impact with these policing in the next couple of years because it's going to take them a long time before they gain any experience? Over and above the fact that in the previous financial years, like you've alluded, we've had a reduction in allocation. Now we're increasing it. So overall, there's a net reduction, not an increase. Now, the issue of socialism, 46% of people in the country are in some form of socialist system. What do you see as the risks with this in the long term? Can we sustain this? Shouldn't we put in other measures to have a more productive, a more inclusive economy rather than having our people rely on this 350, and which you and I know does very little, although it does to some good things, which we need to thank government for that. But not enough, I think. Then the other issue that I want to deal with. Now, we have a three-sphere government. And I'm getting the impression, while we as the NFP had been repeatedly calling for a district model, but what we really said was we need a national and a district in order to contain the cost and spend less money on administration and, and say, compensation to employees, but more on services, goods and services themselves. Do you not see that we are now almost introducing a 40-year-old government, which is now going to increase the public sector wage bill? Because all that is happening is this, that there is, you're going to have the district overseeing the local, the province overseeing the, the, the district, the national overseeing the province and everywhere. So I'm not sure here what is your view in terms of that. What is your view on the skills that are leaving the country? The people that are leaving the country are skills, it's very well skilled, and they are the taxpayers. What, about 13% of the people pay taxes in this country? And of that small percentage that pay, many of these people are currently leaving the country. Now, you correctly uh, 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 identified the challenges that the state-owned entities have, and they have the responsibility in this country to promote infrastructure development. How do you envisage we deal with this problem given the state of our uh, um, state on entities? Chairperson, I'll go to the last one and I'll stop even though I have many more, is South Africa has the capacity, the cap capability and the human resource to be able to become a manufacturing giant for export. How would you deal differently with the fact that every item, every other item in this country is imported? having a massive impact on our manufacturing, which is getting shut down. Please tell us how you will deal with that differently. Thank you. I'll stop there for now, Jeffrey. Thank you, uh, Honorable Imam. Honorable uh, Judge, you're next. Thank you, Chairperson, and thanks and for the presentation. Thanks for the presentations. Um, my first question is to the FFC. Um, you did speak quite a bit about the state-owned enterprises, you know, your view of their role, et cetera, which I don't share, but anyway. But specifically, you spoke about the new state-owned enterprise, the sort of uber state-owned enterprise to which the others would then report, or I don't know how the mechanism would work, but there would be a new state-owned enterprises. And then it would theoretically, uh, hypothetically look after the other state-owned enterprises. And from your presentation, it's quite clear that you like the idea. Now, of course, I couldn't think of a, a worse idea, frankly. But what I want to know from you is why do you actually like that idea? So, for example, what, what makes you think that it's going to be any different? So we have all these state-owned enterprises. We know the problems. I won't bore you with them. We know what the problems are. Why is it going to be different if you have another state-owned enterprise that is overseeing these other 
non-functional uh, enterprises. Um, so why, why would it be different? What makes you think that? So we, how did you reach that conclusion? And then for both um, the budget office and the FFC, I want to know, you've obviously done your projections and you've put some numbers up there, which is good. Um, I want to know what assumptions you are making. So when, for example, you're factoring in the public sector wage bill and you're factoring in the state-owned enterprises, what assumptions are you making? So are you assuming, for example, on the public sector wage bill that it will continue on its current trajectory and the implications then for the FISC and, of course, the amount of uh, money we need to borrow? So that that I want to be I want you to be clear on the assumptions you're making, and then also on the state-owned enterprises. Given that we can see that there is a reduction in the amount of money that's going to be put onto them, but it's still significant. What assumptions are you making? Are you making that there will be no um, additional bailouts, or what is it that you are actually factoring in? Because I'll be very interested to know how you're deriving your numbers. And then finally, for both of, of the, the presenters today, we know that it's very important that we attract capital investment, uh, investment capital into our economy. And the key sources of that is obviously business, local and, 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 and foreign, and also encouraging domestic savings. Now, certainly from what I saw on the budget, there was not stimulation to um, encourage domestic saving by removing some of the tax barriers, for example, um, increasing the um, limits on the uh, tax-free savings accounts, et cetera. So I would like to know from both of you, what is your view on the measures taken to stimulate domestic savings and also to in attract investment capital, both locally and um, foreign? Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank Can you I very much, Chair. Honorable, Honorable Judge, yeah, on the Timulatan, you can come in. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me. Yes. The, yes, I'm on the platform. Thank you, Chair. Let me acknowledge the, the presentations from the FFC and the PBO. My questions are to FFC. On their slide number nine, uh, they have mentioned there that according to the expanded definition of unemployment, the unemployment rate increased by 2.2 percentage, percentage points to 46.6% in quarter three 2021 compared to quarter two 2021. I just want to find out from them. Do they think that, uh, is there any possibility for this country to recover and reduce the, the number of unemployment at any time soon? Second question, based on the slide 11, uh, it says there that that uh, servicing cost will exceed 300 billion per year from 2023, 2022 to 2023, uh, becoming the fastest growing spending item. Will, will South Africa be able to recover from the debts? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mletani. Ntate Raida, please lower your hand, Dr. Mletani. Thank you very much, that person. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and good uh, good day to everybody. Sorry, I see my... Yeah, there we go. That's better. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, thank you for the presentations. So, um, yeah, um, I think it's an interesting budget uh, and quite important to, to note. Yeah, so from the presentations, let's get into it. So I think that... that there were comments about the social wage bill coming out of the, uh, the the PBO's presentations, although there were there were some contradictions in that presentation itself. But I think that it, you know the president himself mentioned in his reply to to Sona the issues around the crowding out of the social wage bill, which I think you know it's important to note that there is um, um, there is acknowledgement that, uh, that 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 there is a crowding out at this stage, 
uh, and, and it would be nice to do more. But I think the reality is that, that a lot of really important spending is currently being crowded out by the servicing of, the, uh, of, of, of government debt. And the reality is that, you know, one of the biggest increases in departmental spend goes to National Treasury, um, and there's a nice big jump there, um, which really, when you go and interrogate the detail, goes, goes back to uh, funding the interest bill um, and, and, and repayments on government debt. So I think crowding out not only of the social wage bill is, is, is something that's worth commenting on, but quite importantly, and the thing that no one's mentioned here today is, is, is the defence budget. Um, and it's something that I would like to perhaps pick on a little bit, because the reality is that, and we've seen the uh, comments in, 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 in various uh, publications recently, uh, certainly following the budget uh, speech, that the, um, uh, the Defence Force, there's been much more reliance placed on the Defence Force recently. Uh, we have international instability. Uh, now recently, which uh, no one, I mean, we don't need to, to draw pictures for anyone, but we've got a regional instability as well, particularly with the issues around uh, our neighbor, uh, Mozambique, uh, and the issues there, and the deployment of men, even uh, recently, uh, with an uncertain uh, horizon uh, or, or, or end of deployment there. I mean, there's, there's substantial implications to that financially for our country. In addition to which, the reliance on the Defence Force over the um, July insurrection uh, of, of, of last year, um, as well as through the uh, COVID lockdowns, uh, has actually shown them, and I mean, the reality is in July, we had a comment from, uh, from the Defence Force that uh, they had to reach into the back of the cupboard in order to ensure that they were properly um, capacitated to go and, and facilitate what they did um, um, in, in, in July in KwaZulu Natal and in Gauteng. Um, and in spite of that, uh, the, the, the response is still deemed by many to be fairly inadequate. So the, the, there's a general acknowledgement, as I was saying, um, in many publications recently, that there's insufficient funding uh, just for the simple maintenance of what we have. So we're not even in a position to enhance our defence capabilities, but our... Um, um, our, our Navy vessels are not being repaired, um, and, and there, there is just no money in that budget to enable them to be repaired. The Air Force is in a worse position, at least the Navy gets a small increase this time around. The Air Force actually doesn't get any increase, um, and so our airplanes are going backwards. And you know, this has real, real impacts. So the corporal that was killed in uh, Mozambique towards the end of last year, uh, there are indications that that came about as a result of a lack of air support. Um, and that lack of air support is just because there are not enough helicopters, there's not enough planes there to deal with that. So I think that, that uh, crowding out of, of, of spending in other departments, uh, I would have liked to see a little bit more comment on that. Um, then, yeah, from the PBO, uh, just a reminder, please, you're presenting to joint committees, uh, and it would have been nice to have some of this so I'd review provincial um, and local government. Um, and specific to that, so thank you to the, the FFC for, for your presentation, uh, which included that. And, and, and one, one of my big concerns is the, and you mentioned that the 9% allocation to local government. And uh, wow, okay, so with that background, you can't see what I'm holding up. But what I have is the uh, 2020 um, uh, publication by the FFC. And if you have a look, um, I quite enjoyed it. You know, there's all the, all, all the markers that show that there were a lot of good things that came out of that publication. Speaking about the insufficient allocation to local government and the fact that it needed to be increased. Now, the, re the, the reality is that we're seeing a very small increase in that. But I believe, and this is something that goes to both provincial increases that are happening and the local government increase, is that these are paper-based increases only. And the fact is that what we're seeing is a move substantially towards uh, taking direct grants to uh, locals and provincial government and uh, moving those into indirect grants. So effectively, spending the money still in the national department, but just repackaging the way it looks so that there can be a, a little bit of lip service and an indication um, that, that there is a move 
towards uh, better funding in the other spheres, when actually it's not that, it's just a case of repackaging. I'd love to hear the opinions on that specifically from the FFC um, and in light of the document that, I've, that they published in uh, 2020, 2021. Um, right, uh, then, yeah, uh, another issue that I found is that, you know, that I had hoped to hear a little bit more about. We heard about an infrastructure-led economic recovery. Now, this goes back all the way to, to the 2021 discussions uh, from the president. I'm not sure that we see that infrastructure uh, spent uh, in the current budget or sufficient of it um, to, to really kickstart the, the local economy. And I'd love to hear some as well from, from, from both presenters, certainly. Um, because, frankly, if one looks at the, um, the, the uh, economy over the past year, uh, construction sector is by far the laggard. So we, we, we've seen good increases in uh, uh, mining, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, manufacturing as well has had some, some good increases. But the construction sector really seems to be the laggard. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it kind of flies in the face of what we're saying. We're saying that we want infrastructure-led recovery. But uh, the spending is not happening to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to do this. Um, and, of course, the result is that we, we're seeing the construction industry suffering. Um, I think uh, Drake Imam spoke about the district development model, and I, I'm not going to repeat really what he said. He did identify the issue about us creating a fourth uh, tier of government. Uh, you know, and, and this when uh, devolution is probably the... Um, uh, the ideas being followed um, across the world, generally speaking, devolution is something that's being pursued. Uh, we've seen Kenya following an excellent model. Zambia as well um, has gone uh, towards better devolution, um, and yet we we are creating more and more of a, uh, a tiered hierarchical structure, um, and the costs associated with that are, are, are quite heavy. Um, I had one other point that I thought that I hadn't noticed it down, so I'm going to leave it at that, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ryder. Uh, Akbar uh, Boutar Vessels, next. Please open thank your. You. Okay, thank you. Uh, You can close the you can close the video. Honorable Vessels, you can close the video. I, I can hear your your network is not stable. I'm struggling to hear you. Side. See your your bandwidth is analysis. Is it only me who's struggling to hear honorable uh, vessels? No, all of us are struggling to hear him, Chair. Leaks. Somebody no. please advise him to close the, the video. Maybe we okay why they're still there dealing with the issue of connectivity for honorable vessels will come back can we allow honorable Oka to take the stage the part my honorable Okay. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, Honorable Chairperson, I want to start with PBO. There has been mentioned on page four of uh, the presentation of the conflict in Ukraine uh, and the effects that that might have on our economy. Now, firstly, I want to state that it is not a conflict in Ukraine. It is a full-out war in Ukraine that Russia started without being provoked to do that. The question is, and, and it was said that it has not been worked in, into any of the calculations. We are sitting with a budget where we know that there are no room for error. And we know that this war in Ukraine 
this unprovoked war in Ukraine will have a huge effect on South Africa and on our economy here. Uh, we can just imagine what our fuel prices will look like if the dollar strengthens, the rand weakens, and uh, if the oil that is produced from Russia does not get distributed. It will have a huge impact on South Africa. So my question is firstly, or my, my statement is that I think that our government needs to do much more in order to try and stop this inhumane war that is uh, going on there, so that the effects on South Africa with regards to the economical uh, downfall that we will uh, experience due to this will be limited. Uh, I think that is very important. But to call this a conflict, it's, it's an understatement of the year. Uh, further to carry on, it is very disturbing to see that on page eight of PBO's uh, presentation that some departments like the Department of Health had to surrender their funds. Uh, if you look at what the president say with regards to the job creation stimulus package or the uh, presidential employment service that they wanna do, and I think there needs to be much more consequences for government departments that did not spend money that was allocated to them. We, we hear this every year, but we do not see consequences for those departments. The big elephant in the room remains the government labor bill, which is way too high. On page 15 of PBO's presentation, they ask, how do government correct the mistakes of the past? Now, in still going to increase the wage bill of government, in still going to issue guarantees for failing state-owned enterprises and bailouts for state-owned enterprises, to still continue with cater deployment, uh, to still continue with draconian BEE or triple B double E policies, is, are all factors that will not assist in correcting the mistakes of the past. We should be at a point where we don't correct mistakes of the past, but where we flourish on what has been done good in the past. And I think it is still a very, very long way before we get there. Uh, on page 33 of the FFC's presentation, it is said that uh, if all the state-owned enterprises guarantees were to materialize, government debt would increase to more than 100% of GDP by 2026. Highlighting the urgency and importance of reforming state-owned enterprises in the light of the immediate risk they pose to the fiscus. <clears throat> now, if we are talking about reforming state-owned enterprises, it will not be reformed if we keep on doing the same things. State-owned enterprises will remain in the position as they are. We will carry on uh, at infinitum to give out, give bailouts and to give more state guarantees, and it will become more than our total GDP. If we really want to transform our state-owned enterprises, we need to look into privatization, especially of the big state-owned enterprises that's got big amounts of assets. If ESCOM, for instance, are getting privatized. There can be a huge amount of money that can come in. There can be a huge amount of skills that can be obtained with that money, and ESCOM can be turned around. It will not be turned around as uh, if we go on onto the trajectory that we are currently busy with. <clears throat> One last point from my side, Honorable Chairperson, is the whole issue with regards to the equitable share uh, formula. We have, on numerous occasions in the past, uh, actually every year, heard that there are certain provinces like the Northern Cape, where I come from, uh, which have requested for the equitable share formula to be changed in order for it to better reflect the rural positions of certain provinces. We are being promised every year that it will be done and that it will be looked at, but we haven't seen any uh, results with regards to that. So I would just like to follow up on that and ask where we are uh, and what uh, advice we can give to Treasury to immediately try and implement that. Thank you very much. I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Ocamp. Honorable Vestas, I you started in if you had Honorable uh, Vestas. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, apologies for that. Let me try again. Am I audible? 
very yes, much. You are. Yes, you are. Just no. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, let me um, keep it very direct. Uh, I think a lot have been mentioned uh, by other colleagues already, and uh, the, it's quite clear that there's a lot of needs and demands that are ever increasing whilst uh, we don't have that uh, the luxury of uh, surplus, luxury of funding to spend on the uh, demands and the needs that, that, uh, that there are. The chairperson, let me ask a direct question to, to both the PBO and the FFC. If one looks at the appropriation, there's, there's one line item under home affairs that are increased quite significantly over the medium term. It's increased by 120%. And that is the represented political parties fund which in the previous financial year was under 166.8 million rand, and it's increased in this financial year to a 342 million rand, which is more than double, and it will increase over the medium term to 366 million. I would very much like to know what the PBO and the FFC's opinion on this is, and uh, if this actually serves the purpose to address the needs, especially in terms of the ever increasing social needs, and we heard about the teacher-student ratio, uh, other colleagues have mentioned the local government uh, allocations, which are insufficient, uh, infrastructure demands, peace and security, as Honorable Ryder has mentioned it, so uh, I would very much like a comment and an analysis on, on that issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Somebody's, uh, somebody's my, uh, mic is on. Work a video. mic. Okay, Honorable Masugu. Bandile, uh, Bandile. Thanks, uh, Chair. I, I, I wanted to make a, a broad uh, comment, uh, which usually I think uh, the, the team, both from Treasury and from the Commission, will um, expect them to respond to. It's just the, a comment that relates to our unpredictable environment and context in which uh, the budgeting uh, has actually taken place for the past two years. And I think it's very pretty much you know, volatile. And I think there are things that we, we should almost every time take into account, uh, the issues relating to the climate change. We've, we've seen how uh, the climate has actually uh, changed and how it has uh, disrupted a number of uh, uh, projects and also affected the infrastructure, which is not very much uh, well um, uh, maintained. And I think the issues relating to the pandemics themselves have actually exposed uh, a, a number of shortcomings in our planning and in our uh, you know, actually budgeting. But I also needed to, to, to emphasize the point that maybe our budgeting and also our prioritization must now uh, reflect on strengthening these particular aspects that relates to infrastructure delivery and, and issues relating to you know, human resource. The two, the three aspects that I want to comment on, it's uh, maybe it could be a, a form of a question on triple P's, uh, on how uh, we, we can be able to enhance uh, you know, triple P's, uh, the public partner, uh, private partnerships, in terms of infrastructure uh, delivery uh, and 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 our ability as 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 government to be able to uh, to deliver these and uh, in particular in relation to schools uh, clinics and and hospitals because we see that uh, the infrastructure delivery becomes slow and sluggish and sometimes uh, non um, uh, 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 implementable because we 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 rely on fiscal which then takes longer to deliver them. And the pandemic itself has exposed us that we, we, we really need a, a quicker and a rapid way of delivery of infrastructure. And using a, 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 a grants, a, particularly from foreign a, 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 a international agencies, 
uh, that will help us to 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 deliver this infrastructure would be pretty much helpful so there are things that we might need to consider in terms of our 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 mood and our model on how this uh, it all can be done we need more hospitals we need more clinics and we need more schools and this is something that uh, the triple p uh, uh, model could help us and i think it's something that needs to be uh, actually considered the second aspect is that you know the grants that we uh, you know we, we you know we we we, we in the conditional grants that we have they should somehow uh, be utilized to strengthen uh, these aspects of service delivery we we, we have seen a uh, concerns uh, around uh, uh, unemployed uh, employability of uh, our capacity to employ nurses our capacity to employ doctors and it is it becomes embarrassing where a government uh, can't employ uh, even people that they train. You know, you find that there are community uh, nurses who the government then releases them, the public service releases them because they can't find uh, a post or they cannot be they cannot be employed because of a uh, post not being available or funding not being available for employability. So for me, I think there are grants that uh, we need to utilize that we need to strengthen uh, those uh, actually services, in particular, you know, the health services as it relates to uh, our response to the pandemic. The post recovery, uh, the post COVID recovery uh, project or program must actually include um, the aspect of us strengthening uh, this, uh, in particular, the primary health care uh, thing. And I'm talking here in relation to community healthcare workers who have been very instrumental uh, in the fight against the pandemic, but could be going forward, be still be utilized, you know, in the fight against the, um, the HIV, uh, TB, and other uh, non-communicable diseases, which uh, 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 you know have in ravaged our healthcare set, uh, uh, you know, sector. So for me, that's what uh, 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 it's important that our clients we need to put the emphasis uh, in that regard. Uh, I'm not sure about how we can be able to enhance the grants that relates to uh, education in terms of teacher and uh, you know employment because teachers I think as a uh, honorable member vessel said that uh, we, we we need to look at how the teacher uh, ratio is uh, actually in, you know impacted on and lastly I think the the, the the whole point on local government there are municipalities I think across uh, in the country, who are very much depressed economically, who don't have the ability uh, to, uh, you know, to source funding outside the grants that we give them. And we need to be able to focus on some of those uh, actual municipalities, you know, where we, we, we know that there's a, a number of uh, a population that lives there and service delivery is not taking place only because of the basis that there's no sufficient enough you know, funding. So, the post-COVID recovery beyond the economy, we also need to deal with uh, the basic services that we, you know, are important uh, for the country to be able to, uh, you know, to um, uh, able to strengthen these uh, aspects uh, of, uh, you know, of delivery. And I think it's it becomes important that we also consider, you know, the provinces where they've got high uh, population. A density that uh, also might need to be uh, given more uh, in terms of the equitable share. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Dr. Masuhu. Uh, can I now allow uh, Honorable Matafa? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, co-chairpersons and everybody on the platform. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Dr. Janjis and uh, Mr. Sachs. Chair, I'm going to go straight to a few questions that I have. Uh, most of the areas have been covered, but I will start firstly with the global economic outlook that the PBO had gone into detail to highlight as areas that we should be concerned uh, with and maybe have a budget I that is responsive to these issues. Chairperson? You have Hello. frozen. 
Can you hear me now? I think maybe it's the video. Chairperson? Yes, sir. You 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 froze. We, we can we can near around Matafa very well. Is it okay? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You can continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chair. Now, Chair, the, the point that I was raising was around the global economic outlook uh, as issues that um, the PPO has raised and also the FFC has touched on. One of the areas that I want to touch on is the issue of rating agencies. It is also highlighted as a factor that we must consider. I want to pose a question to both parties, the PBO and the FFC, if whether in terms of the budget allocation, are we picking up that funds are being allocated to those areas, particularly those that were identified by these agencies in the previous two downgrades? I know in the previous two downgrades, the issues of the, the sovereign debt was raised, issues of uh, reforms was raised, and a whole lot of other areas. Is this budget sufficient to, to respond to this particular issue? The second one, Chair, it's also again on the part of the global economic outlook and the risks that are associated with investment. And I agree with both presentations that the corporate income tax, it's not only the, it's, it, it is not the only risk that can deter investment. There are areas like the environment, especially as affected by climate change. In one of the engagements that we had with uh, the Department of Water and Sanitation, they indicated the economic impact on the well water system if it is not fixed. And I think that we all know the challenges that are posed by this particular system. And the other one also speaks to the Centurion Lake. Centurion, which used to be a hub of investment, but now because of the state of the lake that is contaminated by waters flowing outside of the city of Tswan, most companies have left, which now takes me to the second point in terms of the budget allocations. I did not see the uh, slide number, but it speaks to the functional budget structure. It, uh, it is in the PBO presentations. Honorable Ryder speaks about the mega allocation to defense. I'm not going to go into that. I will look on the issue of the environmental protection. I also see that there is also a little allocation to this particular area, and it's been persisting, uh, going back in the financial years. Now, I just want to find out also, is there a way that Treasury can really look at this particular area? Because if you look at international documents, the need for sustainable development is found in almost all of them. So it is important that we also look at how then do we ensure that we protect this particular uh, area. Another one which I feel that the, uh, the funds allocated are not sufficient is on the part of the recreation and culture. I'm saying this, Chair, because we have a lot of unemployed, unemployed youth. And the presentation, I think it's of the FFC, states that the budget does not touch on the reasons for unemployment. Now, we also need to look at while these youth are unemployed, and yes, we appreciate the extension of the 350 grand, how then do we ensure that we are able to keep them occupied and ensure that they are steered from uh, uh, ill behavior because of them being unemployed? And I think that the area of recreation and culture can play a meaningful role and the issue that the budget is not necessarily adequate there, it's a, it's a point of concern for me. The, the, the third point, Chair, is on the bounce back facility. And, and here I think uh, Honorable Ocamp will not be pleased with uh, my, my, my submission because when I took the notes, I appreciate the fact that this facility is being made available. Just like on the issues of unemployment, I think the budget also does not speak to the reason why the 200 billion credit guarantee scheme did not work. Now, Chair, if you don't speak about the reasons why the previous facility that was advanced did not work, but you bring another one to replace it, you are also deemed to fail. Because we know that in the main, 
the 200 billion credit guaranteed scheme did work for some, but in particular, for the majority of African-owned businesses, it did not work. In all the constituency meetings, business forums, where they were predominantly attended by black entrepreneurs, they lamented the fact that the banks rejected the applications outright. In some instances, they just reject without even giving them a reason why their applications have been rejected. So the question maybe to the FFC and PBO, did you pick anything up that will at least give us comfort that this new facility, the bounce back facility, will at least benefit the broader spectrum of our entrepreneurs? And why I'm saying that maybe Honorable Ogham will not be pleased is to say, if you allow the private sector to run, or any sector for that matter, in a developmental state, but you do not guide them in terms of how then do you transform society, both socially and economically, such failures of the 200 government scheme will persist. So that's why I differ with Honorable Ogham that no, no, uh, the BEE rules are not Dacronian and they are actually still relevant in our uh, current uh, time. To, to prove that, uh, uh, Honorable George speaks about the need to motivate and ensure local saving. I actually had noted this even before he made inputs in relation to the 2022 budget tax proposals. Uh, and one of the presentations, I'm not too sure if it is a PBO or the FFC, and I would like them to clarify what they mean when they say, whilst the corporate income tax was at 28%, the real nominal collection was roughly 15%. I just need clarity there. How did they arrive at the 15%? And also, just to see if whether uh, it's me thinking outside of the box, SARS is able to do lifestyle audits. You drive a Bentley, they are able to pick up the Matafa is driving a Bentley, but he declared 300,000 as earnings. Is it possible that he can afford this Bentley? No. And then you go into his tax records. Is a similar system of lifestyle audit due to lack of a better word for companies something that the country should consider and maybe as a question i just want to check if whether what i'm proposing have any one of the two uh, institutions we are talking to today picked it up anywhere else in the world why i i, I mentioned honorable uh, george uh, chair is that i was listening to the radio in in the previous week and they say that there is a culture of saving in the country currently south african banks sits with six trillion rands in liquid cash as saved in their banks. And for me, Chair, it's, it's, it's a concern that you have so much money that, that is just lying idle and not being pumped again into the economy to assist the, the work of government in order to re, uh, help the economy to recover. You link this together with the 200 billion credit uh, rate scheme and the tax concessions that we are giving to the private sector. I am interested to find out the reasons how we go to the point that reducing tax will assist with increasing economy. When six trillion is sitting in South African banks as cash owned by companies, which for me, I think that issue of 28% and 15% can be responded to compare what companies declare vis-a-vis -vis what they bank uh, on an annual basis. The, the last point, Chair, uh, it's on the point of, uh, on slide 39 of the FFC, and then here I'm in agreement with Honorable Ocamp that we really need to take serious uh, concern on the issues of SOEs. Just two questions. What would the FFC recommend to ensure that there is alignment on the work of SOEs as well as government priorities. And secondly, how then do we ensure accountability? Because currently a lot of money is lost through corruption and fraud in that particular space, but it seems as if there are no consequences. I will pause there, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Matafa. Uh, Honorable Kaiso, may you please come in?
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I have just a few uh, areas to uh, seek clarity here and uh, contribution <coughs> uh, on the presentation made by both uh, PBO and uh, FFC. <coughs> Uh, firstly, no, no, no. I, I think uh, it is right. It is correct that we 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 have to correct the past uh, uh, apartheid errors, Mr. Okamp. Uh, otherwise, democracy will just slip out of our hands if we don't do that. So we must definitely correct the past. Uh, uh, now, I'm not sure from the PBO. Uh, uh, there are areas where you did not give us a, you know, your clear proposal. Uh, I want to make an example, for instance, on the, you said you are unclear whether fiscal or macro, I mean, fiscal macroeconomic policy uh, taken, uh, it does take into consideration the current situation of uh, war situation which has developed uh, or not. So I don't know what were you trying to, what, is there any specific matter that you want to, to advise on with regard to this matter? So that it is not just a statement that we, it, it, it is unclear. And secondly, it's uh, on the issue that uh, uh, triple uh, triple P's. Uh, you said you made a, a research, uh, and you found that now uh, the issue of moving away in the developing countries was actually working. Uh, now, I just want to check, are you saying the, the issue of remaining there, is it misleading? Because otherwise, if, 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 if then uh, you are just putting a statement that now the triple uh, PE uh, seem to be working in as far as you, I mean, the, the moving away from triple E, triple P is in the developing developing countries, they, they are moving away. And there's a particular reason that we have found, why are they moving away? In other words, you have to tell us whether it, it, it is now working or it's not working actually at the end of the day. So we have to take this particular approach. So I, I think you, you, you have a, 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 a reason to tell us uh, what then should what are you advising us then? I see that now you have made this research and you have found that in, in a number of developing countries, uh, they have begun to move away from this uh, approach. So it, it means there is something that you, you can even tell us now what, what, should, what should happen, not just being a statement. And on the, you also called, went to, uh, characterize the issue of you know unemployment uh, uh, to such an extent that you have defined it as being you know a deterrent a extreme deterrent to investment so i want to come back to the area which talks about balancing the social and the economic you know needs which means then says to us that no uh, definitely the issue if then the the issue of unemployed, extreme unemployment being a deterrent of investment, it is true. Then it means the more that we, 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 what we, we should be seeing reading across all these uh, 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 messages or, 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 or statement on the budget, it must actually talk to those, uh, to this one of these uh, critical area, which is also addressing un extreme unemployment, being a deterrent to investment. So obviously, we would love a situation where now the, it, it is everything is being harnessed towards you know you know addressing that particular uh, uh, the critical area of unemployment. 
in as far as you have put it here, and in as far as balancing the social and the economic. Uh, you, you then also say, you talk about expansionary fiscal policy versus consolidated fiscal policy, but I don't get it clear which, what, what is it that you are advising us there? Because it, it also sounds uh, uh, the statement on expansionary fiscal policy and then also just on the consolidated fiscal policy. So which one has, are you actually saying in future that we have to look to, uh, uh, forward? Because it, 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 it means there, is, there was an intention that you, you have brought these uh, two areas uh, in front of the committee so that we, we should look and consider. So what is, in your opinion, uh, what are you thinking that now it should be a direction that we should, uh, uh, we should take? Now, on, 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 you also did a research on the corporate tax, uh, uh, and, and, and you also said now amongst the factors that uh, were, were, were put forward there that you obtained is that uh, the issue of corporate tax uh, ranked number five as one of the reasons which uh, uh, deters or discourage uh, big uh, uh, companies or, or, or yes, uh, consumer to invest in, uh, in the country. One of the reasons uh, it was said to be, you know, the issue on corporate tax. But as you did your research, you say you find it the same issue being number five. In actual fact, what, what message are you saying to us? Is that the issue on corporate tax is not a major issue. So uh, it means there is something that is an issue here, which perhaps you can advise us uh, so, so that we now know that the issue on corporate tax being a deterrent, it's, it's no longer you know, an, an issue, but there are real issues which are a deterrent to, to us investment, including the extreme unemployment. Now, uh, Mr. Sachs, I don't know whether is it still the position of the FFC on the issue of funding model for the local government uh, municipalities, which we you talked about uh, sometime last year. Uh, I, I want to check whether is it still an issue. Uh, so I, I, I am very much interested to know that because at some stage this issue was raised sharp, sharply raised by Salga at some stage. Uh, but I don't hear FFC being uh, making this an, uh, an issue once more. But one would appreciate that now, now that there is a district development uh, model, uh, some of the areas then will then be reconfigured in such a way that now there's a maximum utilization of budget. Now, uh, yes, uh, perhaps on the in conclusion. On the, on, 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 on the issue of economic recovery, you said uh, uh, FF, the FFC said the basic infrastructure by local government uh, seemed to have declined over a particular you know, a, a period or, or generally. And then uh, now at the center of economic recovery, you also say that now, uh, the state-owned uh, companies are supposed to play a very a, a, a critical role there. But now you worry that now the state-owned of companies, it, 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 it has become very much uh, dire. Uh, it needs a very you know, a serious intervention. Now, it then says to us, and then there has to be a, a, a measures, drastic measures that would enable the survival of the state-owned uh, companies so that they play their critical role of a development as they because if, for instance, the, uh, the budget for, I mean, the basic infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, 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 at that level of the local government is not enough uh, it causes a lot of, uh, you know, challenges then for the 
for the for, for the economic recovery to can take place, given the reason that the state-owned companies are finding themselves in. So there has to be a way that has to be looked into because the two, the basic infrastructure and the and the and the life of the state-owned companies determines the, 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 the you know the survival also of the economic recovery uh, plan at that at, at general. So if there's any impediment in, in that area, it's going to be a, a very serious problem that has to be looked into. Honorable Whip, can you mark the time, please? Okay, so, okay, so I'm finishing, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. So such that now the economic re recovery plan finds its uh, uh, footing. So Honorable Chair, let me uh, uh, stop here for now. I'll, I'll come back if there's any other uh, space of time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Taiso. Uh, you'll pardon me to by interrupting you. The time is not uh, in our favor. I have Honorable Njadu next, uh, and I just took an advantage because you are the whip. <laughs> thank Honorable you, thank Njadu. You. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all the members. <laughs> Chairperson, I, I will be very short, straight to the point. Um, Chairperson, my, my point will be first to congratulate the Minister of Finance on a, a well-balanced uh, budget for the 2022, I think, which is much better than the, the previous budget 2021. I think one needs to congratulate the Minister for that in terms of balancing the budget. And also to welcome the presentations from the presenters. Um, my point will be, Chairperson, on the, the increase of two provinces, which a previous speaker, I, I noted, uh, make a point that to say that it is a paper exercise and a lip service, uh, which I don't believe was the, uh, the intention of National Treasury on the increase to provinces. Um, as the National Council of Provinces, we have we are carrying the interest of provinces. So, um, in in I would just want PBO and and, uh, and and FFC to 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 give us their opinion in terms of the impact that increase will be for provinces and 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 also municipalities. Then, lastly, chairperson is on the infrastructure. Uh, which is a very important aspect, I believe, and 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 also that um, that we also the role of provinces and municipalities on this matter, and how to fast track uh, the infrastructure. So to, for also PBO to advise because as to assist us as the as for our mandate as the NCOP as to how to 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 do our oversight. In ensuring that this, we as the budget is presented, we had to to hit the ground running. Chairperson, in things in terms of that, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Njatu. Very progressive, straight to the point. Uh, Honorable Maswanganya, for Chairperson. We don't have much of the time, Chair. If I may okay. remind you, you know. Okay, no, no, thanks, Chairperson. Um, colleagues, uh, PBO, FFC. Uh, and also acknowledge the efforts that have gone into the research work uh, produced by PBO and the FFC. Um, Chairperson. Just an issue that the debt service cost is the fastest growing. I just want to check if um, PBO and FFC, because they have got the research capacity to do a scenario planning. Because the way things are going, it looks like the country is going to be in a serious problem in the near future. Uh, there is a denial that uh, will get into a stage of uh, dead trap. But the trends show that uh, if this thing is not contained, the country is going to be in trouble. 
Is it possible from one of the two bodies or both of them? Because with scenario planning, you project what you might happen in the future so that we plan accordingly, so that we don't keep on lamenting, come MTBBS, we'll be complaining, come fiscal framework next year, complaining again. So is it possible for them to do that research work? Uh, it, it needs a lot of work, uh, Chairperson. Not everybody uh, can do uh, scenario planning, but we need such. Uh, uh, thanks, Chairperson. I'm covered on a number of other issues. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Maswangani. Honorable Karim. Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Chair. Just very quickly, time's running out, so I'll be very, very brief. Firstly, the PBO, they speak of a new economic growth path. Can they deal with some of the elements of what they think a new growth path would be? Secondly, I too, but it's covered already, I'm interested that it's only fifth in the consideration of investors, this corporate tax on whether they invest or not. So can they just quickly mention if they have time, uh, what are the top four above that? Uh, then to the FFC, uh, obviously global growth was beginning to emerge, be a recovery of some sort globally until very recently. Can they quickly, if they have time, or they can write by your guidance, uh, an answer. What are some of the elements uh, of this explanation for why the growth is going down? I mean, we know about, you know, increases in uh, inflation rates in much of the developed world, and also the interest rates are being increased and so on. But uh, surely there are other elements of it. If they want to reply, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Karim. Uh, the last uh, person is a uh... Oshang, but I see a hand here. Uh, there's no name, it's iPad, and I'm not going to allow this person because I don't know, it's, uh, it's not correctly named. I'll, I'll now hand over to Honorable Butelezi and uh, uh, continue with the session. Honorable Butelezi. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning, uh, Honorable Members. Um, <clears throat> with time constraint, I think I'm, I'm going to be very short. I'll bank other questions for the next session because I'm sure I'm still going to meet with FFC and PBO. Uh, uh, both PBO and FFC, I just want to get your view on the consistent above inflation increase of, of electricity prices. Uh, its impact on uh, 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 GDP growth, on gross fixed capital formation, and on employment and employment. Just want to get your view on that one. Uh, question number two, um, and I, I think um, yeah, both PBO and FFC, please again make 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 a comment a comment on this one. But I would like particularly to hear Commissioner Sex on this one. When 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 VET was in, in, increased, um, there was an, an understanding that. Uh, uh, the first opportunity come to decrease any tax, it will, it will be vet. That's because of its regressive nature. But uh, the, the current budget, uh, uh, instead of dealing with vet, then it went to uh, company income tax. So uh, I, I would like just to hear uh, your view, particularly uh, uh, Commissioner Sex knows this background that I'm talking about. With those uh, two questions, as I said, I'll, 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 bank, uh, I'll leave other questions for, for future uh, engagement. Um, can I allow a, a, a PBO and FFC to respond? I will start with a, a, a P, PBO. PBO, you'll take uh, all the questions, try to be uh, straight to the to the point um, as, 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 as you respond. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Chanchis and your team, once we, have, we are done as PBO, then let me know after that I'll ask FFC to come in. Start uh, uh, Dr. Chanchis. Um, thank you so much, uh, the co-chairpersons and all our members. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. You can hear me, all right. Um, the, yes, we can hear you. Continue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll start and you know, give the colleagues to come in quite quickly as well. We see time is quite uh, behind us. Okay. I think that's the, the first point. I'll probably want to start with the process issue. Um, I think the, the, the 
we focus the WP on the fiscal framework and this presentation um, with the, the, the understanding that we deal with the division revenue and appropriations bill later. And we didn't have a lot of discussion around um, provincial and local government. Today. So uh, do pardon us the chair, because I think I members raised points there. But we thought this is fiscal framework discussion. Um, but we'll, we'll provide input on the daughter and, and the uh, approaching data. Um, I think the, the, I will touch on a few points and I'll give back to the colleagues to, to respond on. I think I want to start with the issue of the, the social grants um, and, and support to low income households. I think just, uh, a, numbers, just, just a second, uh, 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 Dr. Chanchis. Yes. Uh, I, I think I must do this one, make an exception. There's Honorable Rajbansi who wanted to uh, to to have a question. Please, just if I, if I will allow Honorable Rajbansi to come in, um, um, please come in. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. I'm very sorry um, that it came up as iPad, but uh, mine was um, you know on the ECD shift to DSD, and I see no amount was put there. Uh, but I, I think it affects all provinces. So, uh, you know, maybe at some time we would get those amounts that would cater for each province and that shift. The other was on job creation. And I think that uh, the Honorable President has this program uh, with the 677.2 million put the Pathway Management Network. What I wanted to check was that because it uh, looks uh, like a centralized uh, project for job creation, it's welcome. But uh, maybe if we you know, had a policy document, because obviously, how would uh, each province then engage in that program uh, to uh, offset their uh, you know, uh, unemployment uh, levels? The other is, uh, so basically, how, how much of that would be directed to KZN? The uh, next one was about the housing um, grant. And I see that it's terribly reduced, nearly 50%. And uh, as much as I, uh, you know, um, have always been fighting that we need to have a budget that goes more towards causes and pre uh, preventative of a preventative nature rather than just being symptomatic. Uh, but I think that in this grant, we are miscalculating because as much as other grants are important, like the disease-bearing ones, et cetera, to reduce them. But, you know, if you don't have a house, and uh, South Africans, um, you know, for, for us, we see the suffering of people, and if we don't have that first primary asset, there's, a, there's no wealth creation, there's no wellness, et cetera. And I think that that is terribly skewed. Uh, that housing is most important. As long as people have a roof above their head, you will see that, the other uh, budgets will decrease in the outer years. But, and, and why I'm saying that, because we, uh, I really uh, like the strengthening of the, the, the district health system. It's something we've fought for a long time, and I think that that's welcome. The last thing is on the triple Ps, and I want to agree with some of the other members that why are we moving away from uh, the triple Ps uh, in our country? I think currently, if there's... South, if South Africa needs anything, because our taxation is so, uh, we don't have a wealth tax, et cetera. But if we go into PPPs, it's very important. I don't know how that research was done. I hope that they give us a copy of the research because I'm sure some of our BRICS uh, countries haven't been included. Just this morning, India sent out a, a thing, well, it was in the covered in Indian media, Ghati Shakti, and it's where they have a national master plan on triple P's, and it's a developing country. So I think that that research, all the MPs that have uh, brought it up, we need to review the, the triple P uh, uh, policy of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Raj Pansi. Uh, 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 Dr. Chanchis, please come in. Uh, thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Honorable uh, Members. I think um, I was saying I'll start with the question around social wage. Um, I think our emphasis there, Chair Numbers, we say recording stopped. Um, the 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 sixty percent. It's not entirely what goes to uh, low income and and poor, as as we emphasize. Recording in up. progress. Uh, I'm starting with somebody speaking. Okay. The, 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 the part of it, um, there are measures that cross out that um, 
60% went to social wage, and that has to be reflected on. I think that's a point to emphasize, to emphasize there. The issue of the 350, 350 or social uh, grant uh, supporting the, the low-income households, um, you know, the, quite, the point I want to raise here is that as a society in South Africa, there has to be a point where we recognize that they're probably not going to be, oh, firstly, I think it should be seen as an investment also in the economy because when households spend in, 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 in getting the household, when low-income households spend, um, you know, they spend this money in the economy, which in a way it, it has to be uh, seen as um, the economy activity, which goes economy to extend and can lead to jobs, but also can also lead to more revenue generated by, by the state in, in that regard. That, that's the first point. But, but the other point that we have to see it as, um, there, there's a, has to be realization that in our society, there will, there will be uh, uh, people who will never work um, in our society, not because of their own doing, um, which this kind of support they require either way. You know? so, that conversation that, that has to be had, that they will, not everybody will get work um, because of the structure of the economy or because of some of the long-standing issues that we have in society. Um, and, and supporting those households um, certainly is one way of getting the economy productive in, in that regard. Um, they, they, I'll leave to call it to touch on that. So one point I want to quickly come back to, it relates to the, um, the, the corporate income tax and the discussion around I think the, the, the government's objective here, which they've raised before, uh, we know that, um, is try to uh, you know, have a net effect when they reduce the interest, the, the, the rate, to say they reduce the rate, they reduce the expenditure as well, to have a net effect on the, on the, on the revenue generated in, in, in the country. Um, and, and also trying to align it to other countries. I think our argument that they around this is that there has already been the discussion around the reforming the need to reform the, the income tax. Um, and, and, and I think there hasn't been much of conversations about that. And that's a point that we've raised, particularly looking at uh, bringing the tax base. Bringing the tax base, it, 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 it takes different forms. And certainly, uh, increasing economic activities or increasing uh, economic growth is one way of expanding taxes. But also now, when we have seen uh, there has been a lot of discussion around how to ensure that um, the, the income and profits that are checked, that are, that are earned through the uh, digital economy are also being regarded as part of the, 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 the project of the, of the tax space that we got. And I think there's less, of course, our discussion internationally, but certainly in the recent time to realize that there's continuously a quest for developing countries to really think about how are they going to do it over the medium, short term time, take, given the fact that it might not, might not realize international community in the near future regarding this matter. The second issue comes to the, the investment as a way of attracting investment. I think... Mean, Dr. Janchis? Sir. Uh, okay. A little bit right. of, of, of gas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. The last point, okay, I'll just summarize the last point around the CAT, just around the the effective tax rate, say already the tax rate um, in that in, 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 in the corporate income tax rate is far lower than the actual effective tax rate, um, Mr. Matav, just relates to the actual amount of tax paid by the, by the corporate tax taxpayers compared to the, actual, the rate that was charged. Because there are allowances and expenditure that get, to be, that get to reduce how much tax needs to be paid. And the five over, over 10 just simply means the other factors beyond tax, you know, profitability is the main one. Uh, stability, protection of assets, and so on. I can provide a, a more extensive issue that relates to a particular sector, mining sector in particular. Uh, the issue of the, the uh, PP is but I think one of the points we raised around economic recovery plan last year was that some of the measures that were proposed in the recovery plan are off the balance sheet, um, of, of government balance sheet, which makes it difficult for oversight. But, 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 but the issue around uh, PPs uh, leading to contingent liabilities the links back to a point raised by finance committees over the years ago that actually Parliament doesn't have oversight over the, the continuing liabilities, whereas they have a direct implication to, to discuss. Um, I think let me stop there and give uh, Dr. Olangi and Dr. Uh, Mohammed to come in. I'll come in later on the uh, 
Dr. Andy. Thank you, Director. Um, just, just to start, members, um, you will remember that in the um, budget speech, the minister actually indicated that um, they are going to review the entire structure of COE. Um, they will also um, going to review all the initiatives that they currently have in terms of job creation. Um, they're going to review um, all the smaller public entities and they um, indicated that there are initiatives in terms of infrastructure. And then um, they also, the minister also indicated that um, several departments are required to restructure, specifically to be more efficient and effective, also with regards to the compensation structures. So um, some of these questions relates to those things. So there are initiatives in place or they are going to start with reviews. Um, Honourable Ryder, you indicated the whole issue about um, the defence budget. Um, so there was a policy decision that defence will also restructure. Um, so that might be the reason why they're slowly reducing um, the proportion that we spent on defence because there's a lot of restructuring. And I don't know if you um, also received our document that we um, produced last year on certain budget, budget cuts, but we included a budget analysis on defense. And some of the things that we realized there is that a lot of functions in terms of defense has moved from certain um, military bases, but those military bases um, where they remove the functions from to other bases, those bases still exist. So they still maintain um, those bases, but they don't really um, provide a service um, in terms of defense. Then the, the next one was um, Honorable Ocom. Um, how will government um, correct the mistakes of the past? This is actually, this refers not to um, the past um, pre-94, it's the recent past, because um, in terms of the first medium-term strategic framework, 2014 to 2019, um, government realized that they're not implementing the, the uh, um, objectives of the NDP. So they reviewed and they, they found that um, the inst instability in administration, skills deficit, and all those things that are on the slide was actually hampering government and they need to um, uh, um, uh, start um, implementing new initiatives to to um, to correct those mistakes, um, and then all those corrections are captured within priority number one. Um, Honourable Vessels, you also indicated um, you wanted to know about home affairs. The additional money allocated to home affairs is obviously to fund um, political parties. But there are, there's a policy decision that they will create or establish a public entity to manage the, the funding to political parties. So those funds were allocated for goods and services as well as for consultants to establish this public entity. Um, the funding for recreation and culture and environmental affairs, um, honorable member, um, I normally ask the question, what would I do if I had to restructure the budget in terms of the function groups? I really don't know, because do we really want to take from education to, uh, to allocate to environment or to recreation? I don't know. I don't know um, what would members' um, view um, is if we ask members, what would you do if you had to restructure the, the proportions that we spend on the different function groups. Um, I think that was that was it for now, um, members, the questions that I wanted to, to address. Thank you. Okay, um, with your permission, Honorable Chair, um, may I proceed? Let's proceed. Uh, thank you very much. I know that um, time is short, um, so I mean, I can't answer 
uh, you know, the, all the questions that exist, I've picked up some themes from the questions. The one is linked to the level of debt in the country and the issue of fiscal uh, uh, expansion or fiscal consolidation. The second one is linked to the issue of uh, incentivizing invest, uh, savings and investment and, and looking at that. The third one that I'm going to briefly touch on because um, the director did touch on, uh, PBO did touch on the issues is um, PPPs. And just to clarify what was in the PBO report on that. And finally, um, <clears throat> uh, Honorable Karim asked a question about the new economic growth path, which is some, uh, or oh, we suggesting an economic growth path, which is something which is just slightly touched on within the PBO's presentation, but I think it's worth, worth clarifying. So just, um, to, to start the issues talking about um, both debt and investment, uh, in the beginning, um, Honorable Sheikh Imam asked a question about why do we have, uh, about how much spending more on NSFAS and welcoming that, but there's such a high rate of dropouts. Um, I think, you know, and the, the second question was sort of on why we're spending so much on social grants. And I think the answer basically, and the answer that underlies a lot of this is the, the importance of poverty, inequality, and unemployment in the economy. We talk about the triple crisis, we mention it all the time, but I don't think it actually hits home, even to, to, to people within parliament, members, but to the media and, and, and the economists working in government as well. And, and how severe it is and how toxic the impact that is on the economy. And so relating that to low levels of investment, how many students drop out uh, of university, how many students drop out of high school, what the repeat rates in high school are, um, why we need to pay that much in in in, uh, in current grants and why we actually need to spend more on developing a comprehensive social security system. Um, because I think this is one of the major themes we've seen coming out, particularly during the pandemic, but this, even after the global financial crisis and even before that, is that the level of inequality globally is recognized as a problem and South Africa is the outlier and worst and most obscene case of that. And we don't actually take that obscenity and toxicity of it and what that means for everybody, even the richest people in the country, how to fix their lives, the ability to choose what to do, their freedoms, the ability to invest. And so, so, so that should underlie all our thought. The other second theme that's big globally is the impact of, of, of the, on the environment. And what we do know is that what's, when, what's happening with the environment, environment change is linked to the levels of inequality and unemployment and poverty globally and within South Africa, and that the poorest women and children particularly are going to be suffering more because of that. And so that should underlie our thinking. And I don't think that underlies our thinking enough. And so when we talk about levels of debt, when we talk about are we spending enough? Can we afford to spend enough? We need to ask questions about, are we actually addressing the key fundamental problems within the economy that are causing low growth, low investment, and the inability of us to move forward? And so to answer Honorable Karim's question, I think in looking forward to shaping a new growth path and path forward for the economy, those need to be at the center. But at the moment, we're still thinking about things in terms of targets, like what is debt to GDP? Are we in a surplus? Those, are the, uh, those aren't actually targets. Those are tools to reach there, and those should be subservient to the economic growth path and the development path that we, that we, put, that we should be striving for. And so the question is, you know, is debt too high? Are we going to get into a fiscal uh, crisis? Or, or um, what Honorable um, Shangani was, uh, was talking about, you know, and, and the concerns about that. And, and the issue around debt is that in order to, to grow, in order to invest in infrastructure, in order to uh, improve people's lives so that they can make meaningful contributions to the economy, we have to borrow. <clears throat> What's happened in many developed countries and uh, since the global financial crisis, but particularly more and, and doubling down on it, or more than doubling down on it during COVID, is that they actually turn towards their central banks to directly finance um, government debt. Now, in developing countries, we are constrained in that. We don't want to use it that much, but we haven't actually investigated it enough, and, and National Treasury and the Reserve Bank and others haven't actually come to us with viable alternatives and explain why we shouldn't be considering 
the possibility of using that, especially in emergencies, if not um, on a small case by case basis on specific types of spending. So, 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 uh, and and just to point out that in developed countries, there's a huge amount spent on decreasing the Gini coefficient, even in the most equal countries like Sweden or the, the Nordic countries. And over time, especially with increased integration globally of financial markets and trade markets, we, they've seen inequality increase, but they've been greater and greater transfers and more money spent on basic services in those countries to, to reduce inequality. So where, where inequality is low, there's a recognition that inequality is a problem and that it's toxic for society. I think we need to we need to to build on that. And so in terms of how we create debt and how much debt we create, we need to actually consider that in terms of what the money is going to be used for. Is it going to be used efficiently? Is it going to actually address inequality, unemployment and poverty? Is it going to cause us to, to be able to do more economic activities in a positive way? Now, and that brings me to the question, I'm going to finish in a, in a minute or two, sorry Chief, for taking so much time, but these are issues that are very close to my heart. The issue of investment and savings. Um, and and the, the question, for instance, by Honorable George was, why, one, why aren't we seeing more incentives for those things? Now, the first thing is that I think it's really important to understand that a lot of people, including people within our government, the National Treasury, draw on the thinking about savings that they see in first year textbooks, that savings equals investment. And that if governments uh, borrows more, they cry out the, the ability of the private sector to borrow because you have savings equals investment. But, but we don't think about what is happening to those savings before it's invested and how much of those savings are going into investment. So if a lot of those savings are going to, for instance, our pension funds and other institutional investors are then taking that money abroad and keeping it liquid um, in, 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 in other financial markets or buying real estate or investing in REITs and those kind of things which have been growing or putting it into exchange traded funds, putting it into uh, cryptocurrencies, those kinds of things, those aren't going into real productive investment that are going to help the economy to grow and move us onto this more growth path, new growth path that's going to create jobs. And so we really need to think seriously about savings and investment and the impact of government borrowing. And government borrowing may actually be allocating more investment, especially if it's in uh, uh, productive spheres in infrastructure or even improving the lives of the poor than, than what is currently happening in the private sector. And, and I've said this before, and I've showed graphs in previous discussions on MTBPS and the budget, that we've seen private uh, credit allocation to the private sector increasing, but we've actually haven't seen the, uh, a concomitant increase in, in, in real sector investment, in fixed investment. And so, so the thinking about the incentives and what is going to drive uh, uh, investment and especially real sector investment that's going to create jobs um, and, and increase the productivity in the economy, we, we need to actually look at what, what role the financial sector plays and, how, and, and institutional investors and others within the financial sector and how that credit is allocated. Um, and, and lastly, quickly on PPPs, um, the point made was particularly related to, to what we see happening in developed countries. And this was, for instance, when, when the US uh, allocated uh, 1.3 trillion towards infrastructure, it was said very specifically by President Biden, you know, that a lot of that is going to be done by government itself. And, I, and, and we're seeing in, in Germany, we're seeing in France, there's, there's a concern with PPPs because because there's a, there has been an assumption that the state is not effective, that there's more corruption, and, and that the private sector does things better, they're more organized, et cetera. And what, we, what the experience hasn't borne that out, even in the developed countries. Um, also, a lot of these PPPs, and even privatization, and, and one of the good examples to look at is the, the British Rail privatizations, or the, what uh, some authors have called the Great Train Robbery. Um, the, the, what the, the government has had to bail out the private sector, the government has to, had to provide guarantees to the private sector in terms of minimum incomes and other things um, to make sure that they actually keep operating, that they profitable so that the infrastructure provided through PPPs or the services provided through PPPs keep carrying on. And those then enter back into the budget. And, and as um, uh, the director of PBO said, initially, 
when those fall under contingent liabilities because we've said we'll guarantee certain things like incomes and profits and and um, uh, those kind of things, those fall off budget and they're not within the oversight of, of, of parliament. Um, but once once these uh, government has to step in and, and pay the money, then it comes on budget and that happens later and that comes back to bite you and often that can be bigger. So so it's, it's a warning about being careful about the approach and, and, and making sure that you have enough uh, contingent reciprocal arrangements and penalty clauses and other things within PPPs when you do it, but also to consider can government do some of these things, especially at provincial and local government, more effectively. Um, especially where you may not have the private sector wanting to get involved, because we know that the private sector is based on profits and they don't really want to do many of the social projects um, that, that may not have the kind of returns and profits. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Chairperson. Uh, due to time, we'll stop there, and any uh, further question will, 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 will follow up later in writing. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank, thank you, CBO. Um, can we go to FFC, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to start by saying uh, thank you to the honorable members for a, a very interesting set of contributions. Of course, uh, it's, it's completely impossible for us to answer all of the questions on the table, um, uh, given the time constraints that we face. But we, we will try and address a few. I, I, I will ask uh, Trevor Fowler and uh, Elsa B. Rockman, who, who are still here, the commissioners, to, to respond to some of the issues and then ask uh, our head of research, Chen Tseng, to, to uh, respond to the maybe the more specific issues that have been raised. And obviously, all of us will try and be very quick. Uh, Chair uh, uh, Butelezi did uh, pose a particular question to me about taxes. Uh, I would just say that I think there is, uh, the, to, to me, the central or the, the, the my, my, my kind of summary comment on this budget is that there is a contradiction between the present and the future. And, and what I mean by that is that if you look on the expenditure side, there are very large additions to expenditure in the present. In other words, when I say the present, I mean this year's budget, 2022. We've added 100 billion to expenditure, and even last year we added about 95 billion to expenditure. So that is the present, but then the future, we are told, uh, involves significant cuts to expenditure. And uh, there's, a sim there's a parallel issue on the tax side where Treasury is signaling very strongly that the future demands that these structural increases in expenditure be financed by structural increases in taxation, which I think is absolutely correct. But for the present, we want to cut taxes. Uh, we don't want to raise taxes on anybody. We want to give people relief for fiscal drag on personal income tax. We don't want to raise fuel levies, and we want to lower corporate income tax. So to me, it's, uh, it's rather odd that you would signal so strongly the need to uh, reduce expenditure tomorrow, but today you're raising expenditure <laughs> significantly, and you want to signal also the need to raise taxes tomorrow, but today your main preoccupation is lowering taxes. So I think that we need to have a serious debate about raising taxes, because taxes are, are going to have to go up. There's no doubt about it uh, in my mind. Uh, even, uh, I, I mean, apart from anything else, and this touches on the question about scenarios around debt, we, we don't really need a scenario, I think, around debt, because the issue is not what's going to happen in the future. It is happening today. Today, in this framework that we're presenting here over the next three years, the largest expenditure item is debt service costs. And that is really the issue. It's not about the level of debt. It's about the amount that we take out of our national income and out of our tax revenue and hand over to foreigners and the wealthiest households in the country. And on average, uh, over this uh, medium term framework, we will be taking uh, something in the order of 
200 and sorry i'm 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 waiting for my my laptop here but we'll be sorry taking on average 333 billion every year out of our tax revenue and handing it over to foreigners and the most affluent health households and that is what debt service costs are that 333 billion is the largest expenditure item in the budget so this is not a scenario about the future. This is something that is happening right now. And unless we address it, it's going to get significantly worse because over the next three years, uh, debt service costs are growing uh, by around 14% in nominal terms every year, whereas the health budget is growing at 2.3% in nominal terms, far below inflation. So, so that's the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. And that is why, uh, and, and there's only two real ways to, or there's three ways to resolve that issue. The one is to reduce spending. And I think uh, the program on the table goes as far as one could conceivably imagine the reduction in spending. The second is to raise taxes. And we've not even begun to have the discussion about that. And the third is to accelerate economic growth. And uh, uh, we would all like that to happen, but uh, don't seem to be able to agree on how to make it happen. Uh, so, so I will just <laughs> leave it at there. So I don't know, the, 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 whether we raise taxes through corporate income tax or value-added tax or personal income tax, quite frankly, as far as I can see, all three are going to have to go up. And it will only depend on what is the balance uh, between those three. So, and, and we need to really have a debate about, you know, where that balance needs to be struck and how much we can afford to raise taxes in order to stabilize our fiscal position and pay for the huge uh, structural increases in expenditure that have been announced with this budget. Uh, let me ask uh, Trevor Fowler. Uh, if you'd like to say something, and also uh, Commissioner Elsevier Erasmus, if there are particular issues you'd like to respond to. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sachs, and uh, thank you to the honorable members for their questions. Uh, let me focus on the, the one issue which, which has been raised relating to uh, change in the, uh, the percentage which is going to, uh, to local government and to provinces. I think the, the key uh, point we're making about the increase to, to local government is that uh, certainly it is welcome. The one, the one issue which, uh, which is, uh, I think, important is that in spending that uh, increased uh, equitable share uh, is to ensure that uh, the, the expenditure, in fact, is directed uh, in a way that uh, will have an impact on uh, growing the economy. Because certainly in the last uh, 10 years, from uh, about 2000 and uh, Eight, seven, uh, what, 2008 or so, there's been a downturn in commodity prices, which contributed for, to uh, the economy declining besides other factors, but that, that was one of the factors. And now that commodity prices have uh, started to increase, there's, there's still the impact of uh, the, uh, the pandemic, and the lockdown in terms of the number of people that lost jobs during that period. So we, what we need to ensure is that we're able to find the mechanism to address the, uh, the benefit of the, uh, the upturn in, uh, in commodity prices uh, to take advantage of that. The second, the second point I wanted to make about the efficiency of local government spending is that uh, certainly in a study which was done recently uh, by the Gauteng government shows that uh, the support by national and 
provincial governments of local government is uh, is not sufficient really to uh, to ensure a turnaround in the efficiency and effectiveness of their expenditure because most of the uh, the support is really about uh, <clears throat> um, looking from an oversight perspective is really seeing uh, if they are meeting uh, the, the uh, or ticking the boxes. Have they spent this in the, in the right way or spent it according to the legislation, which is inadequate to turn around, to turn it around from the economic point of view. There has to be a specific objective. And certainly there is a balance between uh, social expenditure and economic expenditure to ensure that both are growing uh, and that you get a virtuous circle between the one and the other. And I think we still have to have to address that, uh, that virtuous circle between expenditure in infrastructure that generates economic return and ensuring that, uh, that, that allows you then for greater social, social investment. Let, let me uh, let me leave it there and uh, come back later if there are any other issues. Thank you. I I think uh, Commissioner Rockman did have to leave, uh, so apologies for that. Chen, uh, would you like to take on uh, with your team some of the questions that have been posed? Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, and uh, uh, thank you again uh, to the. Committee Chair, Honorable Chair and members uh, for the questions. Um, I think I'm going to yield my time to all uh, the to my team uh, to come in uh, in the order of uh, the presentation, but very briefly, uh, focusing on just key points, uh, except uh, from my side, just one thing, which is that I think uh, 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 I would like to emphasize um, uh, for the parliamentarians that uh, one has to pay very careful attention in uh, in in exercising its oversight duty uh, of the consistency, congruency, and coherency of the research advisors with empirical evidence um, that uh, that you are advised um, uh, and then received. Um, so, with that, so let me uh, hand over to uh, Jacinda and uh, and the rest of the team. Uh, to go over um, uh, specifics of the questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Th thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, I, I won't be long, I won't go through all the, the questions, as uh, uh, Commissioner Sachs has mentioned, that it might take longer, but we will certainly respond. Around the issue of unemployment and the possibility of reducing unemployment, uh, yes, uh, the short answer, yes, it, it, it is possible for South Africa to reduce unemployment, but this requires uh, both uh, long-term and, and, and medium-term interventions, and also some short-term interventions, interventions that focus on the education side or the demand side in general, but also interventions that uh, uh, focus on the on supply side issues and also trying to get the economy kicking. So, uh, uh, addressing some of the structural constraints that inhibit growth and also inhibit uh, 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 address, the issue of addressing unemployment. This will require a focus into certain sectors that um, generate or generate or are known to 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 uh, employ more people, such as uh, manufacturing. But all this will require. Uh, looking into into uh, what uh, factors contribute to the negative growth that uh, manufacturing has as 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 the negative growth has experienced. So, uh, but it's not only limited to manufacturing. There are other uh, sectors that uh, provide an opportunity to address uh, uh, unemployment at a massive scale. And uh, the issue of reducing debt, I think Commissioner Sex has already dealt, dealt, dealt with, the, with the issue of reducing debt. And uh, the issue around uh, electricity price, price growth uh, and, and that uh, on investment, of course, uh, investment and unemployment. Of course, this uh, has a, a, 
inflation generally, whether driven by electricity prices or, or, or other components, has a negative uh, 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 negative uh, effect on, on investment because we'll have to, uh, because we want to address the high inflation, we'll have to uh, increase interest, interest rates and that has uh, 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 an effect on the on borrowing and access to capital for 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 for, for households and and so so there is that relationship that is that is so it is important for the country to address uh, especially uh, things that are under the control of the government uh, administered prices to address uh, their contribution towards uh, prices this also includes uh, electricity prices and in terms of uh, the global growth, uh, what are some of the elements that have slowed uh, the, the growth? Uh, I think in the main, uh, it's, it's uh, supply chain disruptions, energy price volatility, and uh, also uncertainty around inflation and policy paths uh, uh, going into the future. So those are some that have driven at a global level. But uh, if you look at the different categories of uh, countries, uh, there are different uh, different uh, things that are driving uh, are driving um, uh, uh, global growth. For instance, if you look at developing countries, access to vaccine is also one thing that is also driving uh, 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 the global growth outlook that is that is being focused. And I think uh, the other questions I'll I'll leave them so that. Uh, other colleagues can come in and address some of the of the questions and i think some of the questions were addressed at a general level by commissioner Sachs and commissioner uh, uh, fowler thank you thanks Sianda. um I'll just I'll also touch on a few uh and starting with honorable um sheikh imams uh uh, comments, um, starting with the issue of policing, which in the previous uh, 2021 budget, we saw uh, funding re being reduced, um, as well as plans to cut personnel um, headcounts. Now we're seeing the reverse and with a really large recruitment drive. Um, but when, if we look at this from a budgeting perspective, and we raised this when we presented um, on the second uh, special appropriation submission um, last year, is um, for departments, when they cut spending, we need to cut on areas of duplication, inefficiency, um, and not the strategic areas of a department's mandate. Um, so, for example, within police, there was an opportunity to look at, you know, cutting on administration or protection and security services. Um, because if we don't take this more strategic long-term outlook, we'll continue having this pattern of, um, you know, cutting for consolidation reasons one year and then urgently having to, to increase funding the year thereafter because the previous cuts um, disable departments from fulfilling their core mandates. Um, then on education, um, the quality of education, I don't think anybody can disagree with um, Honorable uh, Sheikh Imam. Uh, there's definitely a need for um, drastic overhaul of the quality of education. Um, and perhaps um, one step uh, that, you know, could start that overhaul is the shift of, of ECD to, to DVE. Um, with ECD becoming part of the formal education or formal schooling system, it does provide an opportunity um, to properly prioritize early learning programs. Um, there's an abundance of research that shows um, that not only is investment in ECD cheaper than investing um, in other uh, parts of the education pipeline, um, but it also comes with numerous uh, positive spillovers. Um, so if we improve ECD and we are able to provide um, learners with quality early learning programs, um, you know, that has a high probability of increasing a learner's success throughout their schooling careers. So we'll definitely be watching, um, uh, you know, this, this shift and how um, the department uh, then looks at prioritizing early learning um, programs. Um, and then I think the uh, question by Honorable um, Rashpansi regarding the, again, the ECD shift, the shift is set to take place in April 
2022, and we'll see a baseline increase of 3.7 billion um, rands um, for the sector, and much of that is in respect of the ECD grant um, with KZN province um, set to receive 187 million of that grant um, in 2022-23. Um, I think I'll hand over to Eddie. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. I think uh, most of the questions uh, uh, been answered, so I'm covered. Thank you very much. Commissioner Sex, are we done with your team? Um, I wonder if I could just add uh, one point. Please come in, Commissioner Fabian. I think the one the one area about electricity prices, um, which I've not heard uh, ESCOM and others talk about, is that uh, at the moment uh, South Africa is in a, between the rock and the hard place because. Uh, a significant percentage of our power stations were built in the 80s, and they have a 30-year lifespan before they require refurbishment to give them a 50 to 60-year lifespan thereafter. Now, that uh, 30 years ended around 2018 or so, and they were uh, 2017, and there was a plan then to refurbish it uh, power station by power station. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so you are now having breakdowns as a result of that. So the, the price increase um, is something that, uh, one, you, we'd have to invest in renewables, which is one, one area. And the second is really investing in uh, in ensuring that uh, we refurbish some of these older stations that could uh, then uh, serve a basis for the base load until we are able to uh, to have more renewables to take on uh, uh, take on some of that responsibility that uh, power generation. So that's that's the one point. The second, uh, which is in our presentation is that uh, at the time uh, Madupi and Kasili were built, were being built, it was the largest project in the world. And there was an art, artisan shortage. Artisans were brought in from all over the world, welders, uh, et cetera, and others. Um, and the one area that we haven't sufficiently focused on is on uh, the training of uh, skills development in the artisan area. We have tended to focus on the higher education, NESFAS, and that is an area that does require some, some, uh, area, some investment. The, ne the next is around the district model. There was a question about whether the district model is creating a fourth tier. The, the reason for districts uh, being in place is that local municipalities have the responsibility to deliver basic service. But there are bulk services such as water, sanitation, which be, go beyond the boundaries of local municipalities. And you would need some, some entity to address that. And uh, that has really been the, the basis for district uh, uh, districts. And the district development model was really to try to address that problem, to ensure that we go beyond the boundary of one municipality and uh, be able to address it uh, in a larger way. In Gauteng, uh, there's a, uh, they have the luxury of a RAND water, which provides water to the entire province plus other provinces at a, at a much lower cost than would have been done if it was done separately by each municipality. So there is, a, there is a role for the district in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me hand back to you, uh, Chair Boutilis. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Commissioner Sex, with your team, um, uh, 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 Director Janjis and, and, and your team. Uh, our members, just to, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have been, asked by the uh, chairperson Frolic that uh, we should keep to, 30, um, to three hours 
with a committee meeting. So we are well beyond that. Uh, but I think it's understood that we had four committees uh, today meeting, but just to, uh, to, to underline that. So the interruptions or the, uh, the coming in of uh, uh, the chairs was about to try and, 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 and manage that. Um, let me take this opportunity to, to thank uh, the co-chairpersons and the oral members, our support staff, members of the meet and every board on the platform. Uh, oral members, thank you very much for being part of this discussion. This is a first bite, as you know, uh, there are still other opportunities to interact with uh, uh, both the PBO and, and the FFC as we deal with the, the, with the budget in, in our committees. Uh, thank you very much. This takes us to the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Recording stopped.